You are alive, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chief. Uh, good evening. My name is Jason Perot, Chairman, and I call to order this Monday, October 18th, 2021 meeting of the Northboro Board of Selectmen. Uh, this open meeting of the Board of Selectmen is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of June 16th, 2021, an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. All members of the board are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows the board to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Members of the public who wish to view the live stream of this meeting may do so by going to Northboro Remote Meetings on YouTube via the link listed on our agenda. You can also find that uh, if you go to the Northboro website, um, remote at meeting access, and uh, that'll take you through to our tonight's meeting. Um, additionally, at our agenda, uh, you will find the information posted for the Zoom webinar that we're conducting. Members who wish to participate remotely will be able to uh, connect to the webinar and uh, do so through that means. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public participation. I'd like to now confirm the members of the board are present and uh, can be heard. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. I'm Jason Pro, Chairman. Uh, Leslie Rattan, Vice Chair. Present. Scott Rogers, Clerk. Present. Julianne Hirsch, Member. Present. And Kristen Wickstead, Member. Present. Thank you all. I'd now like to check with members of staff who will be participating in our meeting. John Coderre, Town Administrator. Present. Becca Meekins, Assistant Town Administrator. Present. Uh, Scott Charpentier, Director of Public Works. Present. Jason Little, Finance Director. Present. Uh, William Liver, Police Chief. Present. And David Parenti, Fire Chief, and our Zoom host for the evening. Present. Thank you all. We also have the services of Northboro Cable Access Television here to provide additional uh, technical delivery of our meeting tonight. Um, ground rules for the meeting. As chair, I will invite each speaker or applicant on the agenda to make their presentation and speak to their application. Participants will provide their full name and hold until their name is called. Each speaker will be asked to mute their microphone or computer when not speaking and to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate meeting minutes. Those responding will be asked to wait until the floor is yielded to them by the chair. Speakers who wish to respond to the comments of others, please request to do so through the chair. And each vote taken by the board this evening will be conducted by roll call. Uh, regarding public comment, if you are connected through the Zoom webinar, you can uh, raise your hand to be heard, or you can dial star nine if you are connected by audio phone only. Uh, I will ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify themselves by name and address first. And then when you are asked to speak, you will have three minutes to present your comments. Uh, this agenda this evening features a public hearing. We'll have comment at that point, and then we'll also have regular uh, scheduled public comment later later in the evening. That concludes that bit of business. So uh, we shall begin. First item is approval of the September 13th, 2021 meeting minutes, which are attached in our packet this evening. Leslie. I move that we approve the meeting minutes of September 13th, 2021. Second. Moved by Leslie Rattan, seconded by Scott Rogers. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead? I abstain, I wasn't there. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Julianne Hirsch? Aye. Scott Rogers? Aye. Leslie Rattan? Aye. And I, Jason Perot, vote aye. So it carries four in favor and one abstention. So now past the hour of 7 p.m. We have uh, listed on our agenda as a single item, but two separate public hearings. The first um, is public hearing for petition 3037797 as submitted by Massachusetts Electric National Grid Company for a poll relocation. If I'm correct, yes. Um, 
on Southwest Cutoff. And do we have the uh, representative? Mr. Chair, I don't show anyone from. Uh, from uh, yes. I wasn't given a name. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Scott Charpentier, Public Works Director, did you have something? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to speak regarding the two pulp editions um, presented by, uh, by National Grid, if you like. Very good. Thank you. So, uh, again, Scott Charpentier, TPW Director. Uh, National Grid submitted the poll petition uh, with the work order request 303-77977. Um, it's to relocate uh, poll P42 uh, 20 feet to the to the north on Southwest Cutoff. Uh, that's State Highway uh, Route 20. It's right in front of the self-storage facility. It used to be Cube Smart. I believe now it's uh, of, of a different name. Uh, was it Storage Pros of Northboro? Um, the relocation will allow the uh, new pole to be on, on a little more level ground, closer to the driveway entrance, and uh, will include a feeder monitor device um, that National Grid needs to uh, uh, bolster their uh, electrical distribution system. Uh, uh, our town engineer, Fred Litchfield, has reviewed the, the application, finds no concerns uh, with it, so we recommend the board uh, approve. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, board members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Do any members of the public wish to offer any comment? Uh, seeing none, uh, do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Uh, Mr. Chair, move to close the public hearing. Second. Uh, moved by Scott Rogers, seconded by Julianne Hirsch. Uh, roll call vote, Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rattan. Aye. And I, Jason Pro, vote to close the hearing. Hearing is closed. Uh, discussion. Members of the committee, uh, members of the board, do you have any uh, comments, questions? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I have the 7 7 motion, which I will read. I move the board vote to approve poll petition number 303-77977 as submitted by National Grid. Second. Moved by Julian Hurst, seconded by Scott Rogers. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead? Aye. Julian Hirsch? Aye. Scott Rogers? Aye. Leslie Rattan? Aye. And I, Jason Perot, vote aye. The petition is granted, five in favor. Uh, next up is to consider public hearing to consider petition 3037796 submitted by Massachusetts Electric National Grid Company for a new poll on Southwest Cutoff. And uh, DPW Director Scott Charpentier, would you care to present? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, this is for uh, National Grid poll petition for work order 3037796. Uh, again, it's on Southwest Cutoff. This is actually just north of the Northboro Family Dental, the new uh, building that was put up. It's uh, across the street from the um, that uh, used car lot near our pump station. So it's a new pole location uh, between P45 and P44. It's referred to as P44-50. Um, it's proposed by National Grid. They're gonna, it's going to include a capacitor bank, which will again uh, bolster the reliability of the electrical distribution uh, system up and down uh, Southwest Cutoff. So the, the application was reviewed by our town engineer, Fred Litchfield and myself. Uh, we have no comments or concerns and we recommend the board consider approval. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, members of the board, any questions or comments? Uh, I just have one question, um, Scott Charpentier, if you could. Um, when I assume the work being conducted for these will take place pseudo simultaneously. Um, I'm not sure what the phasing is, whether there's yeah. a, a, a implementation phase required by National Grid. They are in close proximity to each other. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no other, oh yes, Julianne. Well, I guess we should ask, while the work is being done, the, the residents will be without power for a while or? No, the expectation is there'll be no interruption of power. Oh, great, okay. 
Thank you, Julianne. Uh, any other questions, members of the board? Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Do any members of the public wish to be heard on this petition? And seeing none. Uh, do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Leslie. I move that we close the public hearing. Okay. Second. I had motion by Leslie Rutan and the first second by Scott Rogers. Um, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rutan. Aye. And I, Jason Pro, vote aye. Uh, public hearing is closed. Uh, do I have a motion on the petition? I move the board vote to approve poll petition number 303779776 as submitted by National Grid. Second. Moved by Kristen Wickstead, seconded by Julianne Hirsch. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rutan. Aye. And I, Jason Pro, vote aye. The petition is approved by five in favor. Uh, next up, it's past the hour of 7.05 p.m. and we have Kristen Black, health agent for a COVID-19 update. Chief, are you bringing uh, Kristen She's in? She's on her way in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's nice to see everyone. Um, would you mind if I share my screen to show you a few slides? Sure, please do. Okay. Bear with me. Can everyone see that okay? Okay, great. So thank you again for inviting me here tonight. You know, I had quite a chuckle looking back the last time I came and modifying this PowerPoint, realizing sort of how far we've came and, you know, we're onto that next stage and that next step. So excited to provide some um, updates. I'll cover, you know, just our general case counts, our dashboard, talk about the recent cases we're seeing, breakthrough, you know, whether or not the, the vaccination status of our recent cases talk a little bit about our re recent booster clinics for adults, our plans for future booster clinics, our plans for future clinics for ages five through 11, and just a quick summary of testing that's available in our area. Excuse me, uh, Kristen? Yes. Uh, do you, uh, I'm seeing a presentation view with the main slide to the left and then the next slide queued up on the right. Do you, oh. do you have a view that can just show us the, the main si How's slide that? Uh, as large yeah. as possible? That's it, perfect, okay. thank you. Thank you. So just to talk a little bit about our, you know, COVID-19 data dashboard, just to remind everybody, we're not reporting locally at this level and giving you the data, the state sort of came a long way. And now they have this really interactive dashboard that's available. It's a long link at the bottom of this screen, but if you just search mass.gov COVID dashboard, you'll quickly find it. Um, so you can toggle to the city and town breakdown. And I want you to see that once you focus in on the county, um, then you can actually go town by town to see the numbers. So I just summarized the last four weeks of data on this small table to the left. I want to point out to the board and our Board of Health spoke about this recently. We have seen a pretty substantial uptick in North Bro. Um, you know, it's it's been a steady uptick. Most of the states saw an uptick through the fall. Um, we're just seeing it carry a little longer. It's not reflected in this small table. Our numbers are starting to drop off. Um, so I'm optimistic that we're on our way down from the, we're on our way down from this curve. But again, right now we've seen our numbers or our percent positivity as well as creeping up. This is really the highest we've seen in a while. We have a current percent positivity of 3%. So hundred tests are done um, for the state. 3% of those are coming back positive for COVID. Our case count um, average over the last two weeks from this report that was released on October 14th shows you that over a period, we, we have approximately 70 cases that came in in that two week period. So quite a substantial uptick. 
So just to dig down into those numbers and really say, what's going on? What are we seeing now? Where were we this time last year is a common question that we often will receive. So if I just take like the last 31 days or let's say the 15th of September to the 15th of October, we had 137 positive COVID-19 cases reported in town. So all but five of those were all the PCR confirmed. Um, and the five, again, were the probable cases, which means it's an antigen test that wasn't followed up with a PCR. Um, and just to give you some scale of where we are now and where we are before, during that same period in 2020, we only had 36 cases, positive cases. So that's about a fourfold increase we've seen here in Northborough. So again, a lot around our region, people are seeing uptick for whatever reason, Northborough just seems a little bit higher um, than some of our towns. But again, I'm hoping that's coming back down. So um, one common question, you know, we have a lot of uh, smart seniors, they, they came to me and saw a recent Board of Health presentation and one in particular said, your numbers were great, but I really wanna know of the breakthrough cases, what vaccine did they receive? So I'm excited that we were able to run this today just to present to you. So when we think of these 137 positive cases in the last month, 104 of those were over the age of 12 or 12 and older. So meaning that they're vaccine eligible. So of those vaccine eligible individuals that you know came down with COVID, 44, percent were unvaccinated. Um, so that's, you know, approximately just over 40% of the cases we're seeing are represented by unvaccinated individuals. And as you guys all know, and I've shared the data, Northboro has incredible vaccination rates. We currently for our eligible population fully vaccinated, we're over 85% are fully vaccinated. So, you know, it, it's disproportionately vaccinated, unvaccinated individuals that are, are testing positive in town. But when we look at the vaccinated or the breakthrough cases, um, you know, this is data coming from the state. Of those cases, 17 were fully vaccinated with Moderna, uh, Pfizer was 30. You know, a lot of people are saying, is Pfizer better than Moderna? Is it not? You know, this isn't a, this isn't a scientific published research. I'm not going to give you, you know, R squared and all the rest and whatever we need to talk about statistical significance. But this is a snapshot of what we've seen in the last 30 days. So we do see that there's a, a higher number overall of Pfizer and, you know, we, we can you know, go over to the next side on the right here and just say, well, in town, how many people received Pfizer versus Moderna? I thought we'd have a lot more Moderna. That's what our local clinics we ran for the most part was Moderna until we got to the children, obviously, when the, you know, the 12 to 16 year olds were approved, that's only Pfizer. Um, so for fully vaccinated individuals in town, this report was from September, um, 5,700 or so were Pfizer, about 5,900 or so averaging is Moderna. So it's a pretty dead even split, nearly 50-50 as to those fully vaccinated between Pfizer and Moderna. Johnson & Johnson remembers a one-shot series. There were 643 Johnson & Johnson, you know, um, patients in town. And then, you know, there's some um, that was just unspecified with the state's reporting or mixed. And a lot of people say, how dare they? How could they? You're not supposed to mix. Um, but if you can remember when it was approved for the immunocompromised in August, um, so that was a small subset that met some um, very particular criteria, history of cancer, active treatment, all the rest, um, they were allowed to receive either mRNA. So that's why you're seeing 45 or showing that mixed, um, that mixed number there. So um, I know those numbers are a lot to digest. You might have some questions at the end and I'm happy to talk about those if, if people would like some more information. But I just sort of wanna to jump to really our next planning from the health department. We're really thinking about booster clinics for adults. So we did hold our first Pfizer booster clinic that was approved um, several weeks back, you know, for more of the general public. So for anybody 65 and over, it's recommended. For anyone 50 to 64 with some underlying health conditions, which could be as mild as, you know, not being super fit, you might qualify as overweight, or you have a history of smoking, you could qualify. It would be recommended for the 50 to 64. Um, for individuals over 18 that received a full Pfizer series, they're also eligible. Again, for all of these, you have to be at least six months after your second dose. Um, and those individuals that are the 18 to 50 or 49 would fall into a category where they work in a high risk setting possibly, like a retail store or a school or something. So there's more information out there. The health department's always happy to answer questions along the eligibility rules, um, or you could talk to your medical provider. But again, that clinic, we didn't have the demand we anticipated. 
Um, we only, you know, we only filled 68 vaccines. We had the capacity to really administer a lot more. Um, so it was great to see our seniors out and be able to accommodate them. A big thanks to the Boylston Fire Department for providing staff as well as we had two uh, volunteer nurses helping us. These may, names may ring a bell for some of you. There was a Sophia Wackle, maybe related to someone uh, on on your staff and a Natalie Rogers, I'll say that name right this time, who also helped to vaccinate that event. And, and it was just a pleasure to work with them again. Um, and so at this point, there are no additional Pfizer clinics planned at this time, you know, and, and checking with local pharmacies, there is availability for people to make those appointments. Um, and next really, you know, while the Moderna people and the J and J people say, well, what about us? You know, where are we in this process? So if you're following the news, we anticipate we're gonna have a lot of answers on the 20th is the Moderna meeting with FDA. So what is that? Uh, two days from now, they'll talk more about the Johnson and Johnson and mixing of vaccine is an FDA meeting on November, I'm sorry, October 21st. And we'd anticipate those full approvals could come as late as the end of this week or maybe next week. So we are planning um, to offer um, Moderna booster clinics for our residents. We're working with town staff. We have a COVID task force meeting uh, tomorrow. We'll be looking at locations. Definitely want to accommodate our seniors at the senior center um, for ease of access. And then maybe looking to another location to be able to offer the Moderna boosters. Um, for individuals in town. We haven't, um, again, it looks like the Johnson & Johnson patients, there might be the ability to uh, mix and match. So I don't um, think we'll probably look to offer Johnson & Johnson that would be available at pharmacies and we'll focus more on Moderna booster clinics. So for all those people that wanna be first in line and wanna know right away, um, we've created a sign up form that's pictured on the right, a screenshot. So it's a, the shortcut to it is you can just Google, you know, or type in your browser, tinyurl.com forward slash N borrow. So N B O R O sign up. And it will take you right to a page that's going to look like the screen on the right. And you can choose which sign up list you want to be added to. So, you know, if, you know, for me, for example, I might qualify for a Moderna booster, I would check the Moderna booster email list. And I have some kids in that five to 11 category. I want to know about them. You can check that box. So that list was sort of carried over um, from before. And if anyone's receiving emails and they say, stop it, I don't want it. Um, there is an unsubscribe button. We're using constant contact for that. So just to quickly touch upon the, the next big question again, is that five to 11, you know, when is that coming? And it does seem like it could be around the corner. We anticipate the FDA will approve Pfizer vaccine for children ages five to 11 in the coming weeks. Um, I say Pfizer because that's where you know, the data is submitted for that approval. I think Moderna will be applying as well, but Pfizer's ahead of the game. They have that meeting um, for the Pfizer boosters for ages five to 11 is scheduled for the FDA on the 26th. Um, and I just want to clarify, I know there's a lot of confusion from the public of I heard Moderna was recommended or Pfizer's recommended or, you know, the steps. There's many steps in the process. And so some of those early recommendations or the data's out, people are looking at it. You know, we're not allowed to vaccinate until it's fully submit, completed the full process with the FDA approval, the final sign off from the CDC director. So we got to wait for all steps to be completed. So, again, for both the Moderna boosters, J and J boosters, or the mixing and matching, we're still waiting. Same with the future clinics for ages five to 11. I do want you to know I did submit a request um, just today with the state. You know, So we've already pre-requesting vaccine for our children. We'll be involving the schools in this discussion. And again, I'm gonna point the public to that same signup form, tinyurl.com forward slash North Bro sign up if you wanna be added um, to the email distribution list for children's clinics. And lastly, just to recap on testing, if anybody's drove by Ellsworth McCaffrey Park, you might say, what's going on out there? There's a trailer. Um, can I go get tested there? So I just want to clarify that that site um, there is a test in state program that's run through the Northboro Public Schools. That testing program is statewide. Um, the state has sent staff um, to help at that location as we have five schools in Northboro. The schools decided to pool the state staff. They sent us one or two individuals to help with that. So families that um, fall into the category where their children identified as close contacts in the schools and they're unvaccinated um, would be eligible to participate in that program with a negative antigen test at this site. Prior to school, they can then proceed to school. So they're not missing school. I definitely want to clarify, this state program is not open to anybody identified as a close contact out of school. So if you get a call that your child, you know, is a close contact from, you know, your swimming club that you do on a Saturday, 
you can't call up the schools and say, can I get in that program? I want them to still come. Um, and that's really coming from the state. That's not a local decision. So that program is only for the school setting. Um, and then lastly, just other testing sites in our area. I know it changes in which ones open. There is still, I really want to stress the public, there is still free testing out there. So, you know, there's other options than just going to a CVS pharmacy or, you know, another location or waiting to get a test for your doctor's office. So again, the Stop the Spread site at the Marlboro Hospital is still operating. That's drive through No appointments required Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., I believe. Project Beacon in Framingham, that site's changed. It's no longer drive through. It is a walk-in site, but if they run a really uh, efficient site. You can make your appointment show up right when it's your time and not, you know, not get stuck waiting around. Um, and both of those sites have results in less than 24 hours. And lastly, a new site that's opened in our area is at the MBTA commuter rail station. And that site is open um, Monday through Saturdays with a mix of hours. But again, for any information on these local test sites or to um, receive the link to go to the state's website where you can search across um, all the testing areas in the state, we have again, another tiny URL, tinyurl.com forward slash N borough testing. And that will take you to the town's website where I have a little more information, um, direct link so you could register to see availability for these local test sites. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much, Kristen. As always, uh, we appreciate the updates and the uh, information. Um, I did have one question um, uh, on the Board of Health page on the town website. Uh, are these links uh, there so that people can go to that page and then click on them if they want to uh, sign up for uh, the email list? So it's been distributed, but I think we need to add it probably at the top banner. So that's a great um, reminder. I know it went out with our town clerk. Um, we've moved things around over time, but we'll try to get that top and center at the header for those signups so we can okay. um, make yeah. sure we focus people for that. I'm just thinking okay. it might be a little difficult for people to see this presentation and remember what they need to type into their browser yeah. to, uh, to get there from here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, questions from uh, the board, Leslie. Yeah, Kristen, thank you very much as usual. We appreciate it. All the information. I love the uh, your uh, the PowerPoint presentations. Um, question for you. Is there any guidance that you can provide regarding uh, trick-or-treating? I know parents have some concerns about what to do. Should we do the same thing as we did last year? Should we not really be answering the door and have food out on you know the candy and separate baggies out on a table in front of your house? that kind of thing. And I don't know whether that's being overly cautious. Is that what you would recommend? What do you think this year? No, I think we're a little less worried about the contact surfaces. You know, I think last year we were talking about building shoots out of PVC and <laughs> shooting it out the door. And, you know, it, we were, you know, we were all trying to do the right thing and it was sort of fun and wild, but um, I think we, that scaled back a little bit. But I think the big thing and why I want to stress the numbers were on the rise. It's the indoor parties with masks off that have sort of put us in the place we might be right now with the high numbers in town. So mm -hmm. I really caution people that, you know, it's very important we keep our guard up, even though you're vaccinated, you know, it might not be the best time to invite all your friends into your house and take your masks off. So mm -hmm. I think with the trick or treating, you know, good disinfecting, but, you know, hand washing, um, wearing masks if you're, you know, close to others, um, but you should be safe. Again, you want to limit exposure and every, I think to be respectful of our residents and our neighbors is not everyone is comfortable. You know, imagine someone out with their two-year-old who's really not had a lot of interaction, you know, how can we be a good neighbor and make them feel, you know, work to their own comfort level. So keeping, you know, the table with the individual wrap baggies, you know, I don't know if it's absolutely necessary right now. I would not invite the children into your house, meeting them at the doorstep, you know, keeping that outdoor where the risk of transmission is much lower is really important. Um, but another good point, Leslie, the CDC did great, make a nice graphic with recommendations for Halloween, um, where they, they talk about some of those points. And I think that's something we could probably get front and center at the top of the um, town's page as well. Maybe ask Allie with our rec department to try to get that flyer on the um, recommendations out through the schools and the rec department. So, you know, yeah. some general precautions. I think the biggest thing for me is just try to not have a big rip and party in your house with everybody with the masks off. I mean, that's where we're going to, you know, we don't want to get into a dangerous zone getting into Thanksgiving, you know, getting into the, the holidays and, and our viral load in our community right now is really high and we're higher than a lot of our neighbors. So the precautions would be, 
you know, if you're indoors, you're wearing a mask. Um, even if you're indoors for the CDC, you want to still try to maintain social distancing. You know, outdoors masks are not required. Um, but again, trying to, you know, maintain social distancing when possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm even wondering whether, you know, answering the door should, should adults wear masks because, you know, the kids come right up to you. You know, a lot of them are within like a foot. So I don't know whether it's the kind of thing where you'd recommend that the person handing out should wear masks. I don't know what the CDC thing says. I'll take a look at that too, but. Yeah, I think they generically say when you're not able to socially distance. So it might sort of fall into that category. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, Kristen Wickstead. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, Leslie lives in a high traffic trick-or-treat neighborhood. So. Right. <laughs> My kids used to go there every year. It's a great street. So she needs good info. Um, you said there's a um, there's testing at a commuter rail station. Mm -hmm. um, which one? Is it Southboro? No, it's the Ashland um, MBTA commuter rail station. Okay, Ashland. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions, members of the board? Uh, seeing none, uh, Kristen, once again, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, all the information and updates. And uh, next time we see you, I'll be looking to hear a little bit more about R squared. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone. All right. Good night. It's now past the hour of 7 10 p.m., and we have an uh, appointment of auditor, uh, town administrator John Coderre. Can you take us through that? I would be happy to take you through it. We also had Jeff uh, Gendron from um, from oh, yes. Scanlon and Associates who will, will join us. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of background on kind of how we got to where we are this evening. So our long-term auditor, Bill Frere, uh, he's been our auditor for over 20 years, had the uh, gall to actually retire, and um, which left us without an auditor. So um, as always, although it's not required under Chapter 30B procurement laws, um, to, to go out to bid, uh, what we do in order to get the greatest amount of interest and to get the largest uh, breadth of potential um, uh, auditors, uh, we put out a bid uh, formally and, uh, and we received uh, two bids. We would normally expect for a town our size to receive maybe two to three bids uh, for um, auditor firms, auditing firms that are interested in working in, in municipalities our size. Obviously, the Larger firms tend to gravitate more towards the, the larger uh, municipalities. Um, but we put the uh, bid out uh, out in August. Um, in, uh, in September, we went through the process of reviewing the RFPs and actually conducting interviews. And so that was done by the financial team uh, consisting of myself, the assistant town administrator, and Jason Little, the finance director. And then uh, we also uh, had Jason Pro as the uh, chair of the board participating in that uh, interview process and screening. And so I, I'm pleased to say we had two really qualified firms. And when you go through an RFP process, you know, you have to rank both proposals uh, as either not advantageous, advantageous, or highly advantageous. And both firms really came through as highly advantageous. Uh, so we had two solid, uh, uh, two solid proposals. Um, however, uh, Scanlon and Associates uh, uh, was the firm that we are recommending uh, for appointment by the board this evening. And I think um, one of the things, it, it, the primary thing that really put us over the top with Scanlon uh, was the fact that they are currently the auditing uh, auditors for the regional high school. Uh, they're also auditors for Grafton, uh, Shrewsbury, Westboro. So they have a very strong presence in this region. And one of the things that the, uh, the interview panel felt was important is, you know, these communities, obviously we have a very close relationship with the regional high school, but when you look at uh, Shrewsbury, Grafton, Westboro, you know, we have regional districts with those um, entities as well. We share a veterans district. Uh, we have uh, multiple grants for, for instance, the, the health, uh, public health excellence grant. Uh, that we work collaboratively with those other communities. Um, and so there was a really feel, a good feeling that um, Scanlon Associates really knows the area. They know the entities that we have the closest relationships to. 
And then to be honest, uh, you know, I think there's a tendency to weigh, um, you know, I would weigh the reference of the superintendent for the regional high school a little heavier uh, with the personal experience with, uh, with Scanlon Associates, as well as my colleagues in Grafton and Westboro. As you know, Becca Meekins uh, previously worked in Grafton. She worked with Scanlon had nothing but positive things to say. So again, two excellent firms. Uh, we're really pleased to, to see the interest in the community, uh, but I think the presence and the um, involvement in the area communities that we have affiliations with um, tip the scales in favor of uh, Scanlon and Associates. So um, tonight uh, we're here before you asking uh, for your um, approval of the recommendation to make the appointment of Scanlon Associates as the town of Northborough's new auditors. Uh, and that would cover fiscal, uh, it's a three-year engagement. It covers fiscal 21, 22, and 23. Um, we do have Jeff uh, Gendron from Scanlon Associates here with us this evening. Uh, I certainly can answer any questions that uh, members of the board may have, uh, and then certainly uh, you're welcome to ask any questions that you have uh, through the chair of uh, Mr. Jenrin. So with that, I'll turn it back to the chair. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, I just want to thank John, uh, uh, Becca, and Jason Little, finance director, for um, uh, the work in reviewing the RFPs and uh, evaluating criteria. Um, uh, very excellent uh, review process and questions during the interview process uh, to, to understand uh, the capabilities of the two applicants. So I'm uh, very pleased with the, the, um, the process and very pleased with um, the recommendation. Um, uh, any members oh, of the board? Uh, Mr. Yes, John. Mr. Chairman, if I can interrupt, just one more thing I did sure. want to add. Uh, in, an RFP, in an RFP process, the proposers split their technical proposals away from their price proposals. And so you evaluate them based on their te technical proposals, and then you look at the, um, the monetary uh, aspects of it. But I just wanted the board to be aware that the price proposals was a dead heat as well. So uh, they all know what we were engaged with our previous auditor for. Both firms submitted the same uh, price uh, for fiscal. Uh, well, I think uh, one firm was 29,000, actually was Scanlon. Uh, 29,000. And then um, the other firm was 29,500. So, I mean, basically a dead heat. So uh, we would not make the decision on an order for $500 difference in their price, uh, but just so that the board, uh, and again, it's in your packet, understands that uh, the price proposal factors, uh, we do look at that. If Scanlon came in at 100,000, we might be having a different conversation, but qualifications were, were both highly advantageous. The price proposals were essentially the same. And, you know, when you, it's just like any other hiring process, you're looking for the things around the margin that might tip you towards one candidate or firm over another. And, um, and again, the local presence and the affiliations. The other thing I did want to mention is that um, Scanlon did make a, a, a commitment to uh, get us back onto our uh, early schedule for audit, it's audits. As you know, we're one of the first communities to get audited because our books are in really good shape and, uh, and we get that going. That feeds into our budgeting process and our financial trend monitoring meeting in December. So we wanna make sure that we're trying to keep that. You know, some communities aren't getting their audits done until you know, February, uh, you know, and um, uh, so that was something that was important to us that we spent some time talking about, so. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that people weren't, in case you were wondering, if there is a price difference, it's negligible. Right. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Chair. very much for, uh, for that clarification, John. Uh, Mr. Jenrin, I just want to say hi, and uh, thank you for being here uh, this evening. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll have any questions, but I uh, um, appreciate your, uh, your presence here uh, this yep. evening. Uh, members of the board, any uh, questions? Kristen? Hi, so I'm new too. I, I've only been on the board since May. So um, I just wanted to know if um, Mr. Gendron, you could just tell me a little bit of basic stuff. So um, will you be going back in um, into say last year's auditor's report and maybe other years and doing a little research and kind of familiarizing yourself? With the report, um, 
Yeah, we, we will be focusing on FY21, but we will have to carry forward uh, balances from the prior year. And we will, um, Tom already made a request that, you know, once we get, you know, approved for the audit that we'll have to get some of their um, crosswalk from the financial statements to the financial report that they did from your previous auditor. So, you know, we will get those balances. Um, okay. So, yeah. So doing a little bit of back reading is a good idea. Okay. Because I, I, I was doing a little too. And I just figured if I'm doing it, you're probably... Um, I know this may sound weird to the rest of you, but I'm not used to the world of auditing. <laughs> so I'm just trying to do some homework. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Krista. It, it's riveting uh, information, <laughs> believe me. It's, uh, uh, any other questions from members of the board? Leslie. Yeah, first of all, I do want to thank Bill Frere. John, if you could pass that along. He, he was an extremely diligent person, um, always made a nice presentation in our meetings, and I could tell that he's just a very detail-oriented person. I'm sure anyone in this business has to be, but he always he always did such a wonderful job and provided wonderful reports. So I want to thank him for 20 years. Is that what you said? At least. At least 20? I've been here 19. He's been the auditor all the time I've been here, so. Um, and I do like the idea that there's a connection with the school district. Um, and I guess my question about that is, um, why do I like that? Why is it good to have that kind of connection? Is it because the, the firm would be familiar with the way we do business, um, terminology, the way we're organized with our financials? What is the main reason that's an, it's an advantage to have that kind of connection? That is a question for me or for, I mean, I'm happy to, to respond in terms of the perspective of the interview committee is yeah. that if there's an issue uh, like between the two entities, because we share a financial relationship, they have all the information mm -hmm. unfiltered. They have everything to, to work through that. Uh, but again, just the familiarity uh, of, of knowing a broader picture of what's going on. And again, as we, and we talk about, you know, forming regional um regional uh, partnerships with other communities, it's not absolutely necessity, uh, a necessity, but again, uh, it's, it, it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a good advantage. Um, and price-wise, and, and you mentioned the, these two firms um, specifically, but as far as how we were, or what we were paying Bill Frere and his firm, uh, what are we talking about here in terms of the difference? None actually it was a third year of Bill. Third year of Bill Frere's contract was, I, I believe, about twenty nine thousand. Uh, typically, the engagement is for three years, um, and it's uh, and um, some oftentimes uh, the price is held for those three years, and sometimes there's a small escalation. It just depends on how it's a uh, bid, but no, that's what we would expect uh, okay. in terms of cost wise. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you. Again, it's a small. It's a small world. They all know each other. They all kind of know uh, what the market is and, um, you know, and we got exactly what we would, would have expected from, from both proposals. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jason Little, finance. Oh, I would just add that I think all of the firms that do their due diligence too of asking us what our budget is that we have available to, to bid within that. So they, I don't think any firm would, at, would uh, submit a proposal that was gonna be above what we have available to, to pay them. So I just add that. So we're we're within the budget for to uh, to award this contract. Okay, super. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Scott Rogers. Yeah, thank you. I guess John, this might be a question to you: is uh, with the opportunity of you know, changing uh, the services and changing the contract, was there was there anything that that you saw uh, in terms of terms and services that would be good to change, you know, our learnings from, from past years or, or definitely things that you, you wanted to preserve in those, that contract as well. Any, any changes? No, I, you know, again, this is a compliance audit and this, the, the, it's pretty standard that what they, what their job to do is pretty standard with they're here or Southboro or Westboro. They're basically doing the same, uh, the same thing, except with the exception of one thing. And, and, and again, 
you know, uh, Scanlon, um, Tom Scanlon, who wasn't able to be here this evening uh, of Scanlon Associates, um, he communicated very clearly to us that, you know, the audit is really 365 days out of the year. And, and, and what he means by that statement is we rely on our auditors for advice. So if there's a question, if Jason isn't sure how to book something, if he's not sure how to treat something, we're able to call the auditor and they'll help us with that. So um, most recently, and we tried to stump the, everybody during the interviews with some, some ARPA uh, American Rescue Plan Act uh, questions and some COVID-19 because it's, it's literally unfolding in real time. And so you're, you, you know, those are the types of things where, you know, we want to do the right thing always. And, and uh, it's kind of like, you know, legal advice, you know, before you go making a decision, a legal decision, you want the advice from your legal counsel, right? Because they're going to have to defend it at the end. So um, what we're looking for is an auditor that's a partner with us, not just at the end of the process, but during the year, if there's questions and support. And that was something that we heard very strongly from the references of our neighboring communities. Very easy to work with always available, willing to give you time outside of, you know, what most people think of is as the audit uh, um, time frame, you know, uh, and it's important uh, because we need to have that uh, relationship. That was something that Bill Frere was always good with, his time, very generous, and, um, and that was something we we're looking for in an auditor as well. Again, we want to make sure that we're doing the, uh, doing the right thing. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, no other questions. Uh, members of the board, anything else? Seeing nothing, uh, do I have a motion? Mr. Chair, I move the board vote to appoint Scanlon and Associates LLC as auditor for the town of Northboro pursuant to their proposal dated September 3rd, 2021, and to authorize the town administrator to execute a contract for fiscal years 2021, 2022, and 2023. Second. Moved by Leslie Rutan, seconded by Julianne Hirsch. And uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rutan. Aye. And I, Jason Pro, vote aye. Carries unanimously. Uh, Mr. Jenner, thank you very much. Congratulations. And uh, we look forward to working with you. Now you're in the no, hands of John Coderre and Jason Little. So <laughs> now get going on that audit. We're late. <laughs> um, yeah, likewise. Uh, thank you for your time. And we uh, look forward to doing business with the town as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. It's past the hour of 7.20 PM. We next have Scott Charpentier, Public Works Director. Uh, first item, set fees for plowing and sanding private ways for the upcoming 2021-2022 winter season. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we do this annually. Uh, the Town of Northboro Department of Public Works still provides uh, snow removal services to two private ways in Northboro, Harris Ave and Maple Lane. There are provisions in the town code uh, for these services. Um, we go through a... Uh, rate increase pretty much every year. Um, we do our best to, to keep it reasonable and to try to keep up with where costs are going. Um, costs have escalated substantially um, for this winter season, the 21-22 winter season. Uh, we are part of a uh, consortium bid for uh, roadway uh, ice treatment chemicals, uh, roadway salt, as well as calcium chloride. Um, those costs have escalated 37% over last year. Um, and we also uh, reevaluate our plow contractors, the companies that help us uh, with snow removal every year um, to keep pace with the industry rates. Um, those rates increased 5% this year. So what we're proposing this year was very similar to what we've done in the past years is to increase the per event, um, per service cost from $210 to $215 for each of the roadways. Um, that represents an approximately uh, two and a half percent increase. Um, it's it's fair and reasonable, I believe. We uh, observe both roadways. Uh, we do that every every fall to make sure they're in a condition adequate for us to uh, provide the service safely, which is um, snow plowing and salt treatment. Uh, so again, uh, we're proposing a five dollar increase, uh, approximately two point four percent, 
to, um, to help keep pace with what the cost of the service is. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, members of the board, any questions? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I move the board vote to set the fees for plowing and treatment of private ways less than 3,000 feet for the 2021-2022 winter season as follows. $215 per storm per private way for plowing and $215 per storm per private way for treatment. Second. Moved by Scott Rogers, seconded by Leslie Rattan. Any further discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rattan. Aye. And I, Jason Perot, vote aye. Carries unanimously. Uh, the second item under this uh, agenda is uh, update regarding the post-occupancy traffic study on Bartlett Street. And once again, Public Works Director Scott Charpentier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you're aware, uh, Town of Northborough engaged uh, Central Mass Regional Planning Commission, CMRPC, to prepare a post-occupancy uh, study for the development of 330, 350 Bartlett Street, the Amazon property. Um, there's there's a, a, a number of tasks that were included in that, in that scope of work. I'll give you a quick update on where they are and what is forthcoming for future tasks. So one of the items that was um, identified for, for uh, the roadway audit is a uh, crash analysis. We, the Central Mass Regional Planning Commission collected uh, crash data both from Northborough PD by visiting the facility and speaking with um, staff there, as well as MassDOT. They've compiled all of that data. They're currently correlating it and tabulating it to provide us a little bit more information on um, how the crashes have trended in the past, uh, vehicle types, and uh, conditions that may have attributed to those crashes. So that, that will be, um, after the anal analysis is done, that'll be incorporated in the final report. The um, a couple other items that they uh, data that they've collected, they you, you're aware that they've done uh, traffic counts back in May um, at seven different locations in the area. I previously discussed that with this board. Um, they're utilizing that data in conjunction with turning movement um, counts that were conducted. Those turning movement counts were conducted on September 23rd. There were three locations the counts were conducted. One was at uh, Bartlett Street and Route 20. Uh, another location was at Lyman Street and Bartlett Street. Those two locations were done um, by, by personnel. So they were, they, were, they were physically CMRPC representatives there um, doing the movement counts, the turning movement counts. The third location where counts were collected was at the driveway um, at uh, 330, 350, and 300 Bartlett Street, the Amazon and FedEx driveway. That last location was not done manually, it was done uh, um, automatically. They uh, posted a, a video camera, they had a vendor uh, erect a video camera there that captured for a 24 hour period on that same day, September 23rd, all vehicle movements coming in and out of that facility. Uh, one of the benefits of the video was it, it was able to capture a, a full 24 hour period. Um, and it also is, is capable of differentiating um, what vehicle was exiting, whether it be a FedEx truck or an Amazon truck or what have you. Um, the personnel at each port at uh, Lyman Street and uh, Barley Route 20, they were also able to capture um, the, the user of the vehicle when they were doing their counts, whether it be Amazon um, or others. So that data has been collected. The consultant that did the video work has completed the analysis, the hard data analysis, and that's been provided to CMRPC. So they're in the process of correlating those turning movements with the previously collected um, traffic uh, counts that were done. And the expectation is that we'll receive um, what the derivation, what, what the results of that data analysis are before the walking audit. Um, so that leads me to the next um, two tasks that are forthcoming. One is a, is a roadway audit. It's a, it's a roadway safety audit. So we've scheduled the roadway safety audit for October 28th uh, between 9 a.m. and noon. Um, there's an agenda that's included for the uh, roadway audit. There's an agenda that's included in your packets. 
Um, that agenda will be posted on the DPW's website under news and announcements tomorrow morning. Uh, the agenda is, is relatively brief and I'll, and I'll give you a description of what the meeting entails. 9 a.m. Uh, participants uh, attend the meeting at the high school. There'll be approximately an hour um, just a presentation by CMRPC about the data that's been collected and what the resulting analysis shows. There'll then be a, a site visit, a, a walk. Uh, physically, all the attendees will walk up and down Bartlett Street from the high school through Lyman Street and back. And then there'll be a one hour uh, closure meeting, which is um, more of a brainstorm, brainstorming session between uh, the meeting participants and CMRPC. So we currently have approximately 16 uh, representatives that have confirmed attending the, uh, the, the walking audit, the roadway safety audit. That includes town staff uh, from public safety, public works, administration, um, planning, we have schools, school staff that are going to uh, participate, and we have commitment from uh, some of the facility operators on Bartlett Street to attend. Um, one, one, one focus, uh, one group that we are reaching out to now is uh, neighborhood representatives, um, citizens in the area who want to hear what the process uh, is like, what's going on, want to be, uh, want to participate in the audit process, um, are welcome to attend. They'll, again, the, the agenda will be posted on um, the DPW website under news and announcements. In conjunction with the uh, agenda will be what's referred to as a, a prompt list. Um, so roadway audits, safety audits, intersection audits are, are um, a, a structured meeting format that are used um, in a variety of safety circumstances. Something that maybe um, some of the participants and attendees are not familiar with. So the prompt list will also be attached on my on the DPW website. It's just a bunch of you know topics, questions, ideas to, to, to kind of get people's thought process going in the in the same direction. Um, things such as uh, signs, speed, uh, mitigation efforts, um, traffic signals. Um, there's a, a series of not necessarily questions, but just topics for people to think about. Um, the one other element uh, that so again, that, that audit is going to be October 28th between 9 a.m. and noon, um, beginning at the, at the high school. So there'll be a meeting at the high school. Uh, one other element of the, um, the post-occupancy study is comparing current traffic counts to those that were presented to the planning board during, um, during the, the, uh, the, per the land permitting process for the development at 330 and 350. Um, so they've gone through the data in a preliminary fashion, um, have compiled what, what the counts were and the, what they were taken back in, um, in May, as well as with the turning movements at the exit of the driveway. Um, they specifically counted the truck traffic uh, leaving and entering the, uh, the, the driveway and compared it to the planning documents that were submitted, uh, the traffic study that was submitted as part of the land planning process. Um, interestingly enough, the uh, traffic study that was prepared for the planning board back in February of 2015 projected 2,490 um, tractor trailer vehicle trips per day at the facility. And on September 23rd, there were 1,719 um, tractor trailers at 33350 uh, entering and exiting. So it, it's Good data to have, um, you know, to, from, a, from a variety of perspectives. From the planning board, they can see where the traffic projections uh, during the land planning process lie compared to what the actual facility operations are. So all that will be compiled in the final report. Um, so the process going forward, again, the data is being analyzed now. We have a walking audit on the 28th. Um, after the walking audit, the topics that are discussed during that audit will be compiled into a final report. The expectation um, in, in the scope, the schedule indicates that final report uh, will be provided to the town in December. So we're, um, you know, a lot's been done so far. It's still in, in progress and in the works. Um, you see what's going on up and down the road as far as implementation of some of the mitigation factors. That'll be part of the report. You know, the, the, everything that this board has done, um, staff has done, the citizens have, have, have reported, 
All that's going to be compiled in the report, including the, the safety zone that this board adopted, the no parking requirements that this board adopted. Um, you know, all that's part of the, 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 the mitigation that will be identified in the report. Sorry, I had to find my mouse to unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate uh, uh, the, the presentation. Um, questions by the board, Leslie? Yeah, Scott, thank you. Uh, great info, I'm glad to see all these things are being, are being done. Um, as far as the walking audit, um, I know I can't attend, but is someone from the board able to attend? Is this something that a board member can be invited to? To attend, it seems like maybe it would be a good idea for someone on our board to be there firsthand and seeing what's being said and, and witness and, and see the you know make observations and so forth. Um, just a suggestion. I don't know how anyone else feels about it, but it, it it seems appropriate to me to have someone from our board who would might be able to to be part of this. Can we respond yes. to Leslie? I, I, yes, Julian, I go ahead. appreciate that idea, and I wonder why it would just have to be one of us. I think however many of us are available, it, you know, would be beneficial. Uh, so who we, we have currently, um, as confirmed attendees from the town side, uh, police, fire, planning board uh, representative, uh, public works, town planner, uh, one representative from the select board, the town administrator. Um, a high school representative as well, CMRPC staff, and as I said, uh, facility operators up and down, up, up uh, on Bartlett Street. So the expectation was that we would have a representative from the planning board, um, my thought is would be the chair, and a representative from the board of selectmen um, uh, present during the, during the roadway safety audit. Yes, Kristen? I'm just gonna throw this out there. You guys all know this. I am also a neighbor. I am a resident of Bartlett Street, so I would be happy to attend as the representative from the Board of Selectmen. And um, Scott, you did say that um, you were reaching out to other people in the neighborhood. So I don't know if you're just emailing people who tend to write you emails or whatever, but um, I'm sure some of them would be happy to attend as well if, they, if they're around. Um, and the report that you keep referring to, that's the post-occupancy report. That will be the big thing that finally comes out by the CMRPC. Are they the ones who finally compile this report that you were referring to? There was just a lot of information just now. So I wanna make sure I understand. CMRPC is gathering the data, uh, analyzing the data. They're gonna be developing the post-occupancy study report, including uh, mitigation recommendations. Right, okay. Yes, what CMRPC will be, will be doing it. You don't have to do it. <laughs> Are you going to the, the meeting at the high school? Yes. Right. Yes. Many of the faces yeah. you see before you tonight will be there, I'm sure. Yeah, well, I think it's great because you've worked really hard on this. And I know it's it's been a big one of your projects. You talk about it a lot. So I think it should be there. Uh, let me see. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I haven't even looked at my calendar yet, so I have no idea whether I'm available or not uh, for that particular date. Um, there's an argument to be made that Kristen and Leslie being in close proximity to those areas uh, would be good to be representatives. There's an argument to be made that Kristen and Leslie being in that proximity um, uh, perhaps uh, should not be the representative of the board and some other board member should instead uh, uh, be the representative. Um, certainly the residents of the neighborhood will be uh, having some representation in any case and whoever that turns out to be um, will, uh, will provide uh, some amount of representation for people who live in the area. Um, any other comments? Leslie? Well, getting back to what you just said, I think um, in terms of Kristen and me, 
um, in the event I can, at least one of one of us who does live close to Bartlett and someone one of the board members who doesn't. I think that would be a good variety. So you have someone who is actually in this in the middle of it and someone who isn't and wants to better understand uh, the observations and experiences over here. And just so I understand the process, uh, uh, Scott Charpentier, um, the this set of attendees um, who are essentially participating and contributing, um, they're going to meet afterward and have a discussion, deliberation, exchange of ideas? Yeah, so um, representatives from staff and boards um, will be present at the high school, as will those, rep those um, neighborhood representatives that want to attend, whether there's one or two or 12 or 15, um, everybody's welcome to attend. The, the, the desire is that it's a manageably sized group with focus and, and not, you know, it's not a open town meeting where 300 people are going to be packing up, packing a, um, uh, an auditorium. You know, it's a working group, but, you know, it's important, I think, that residents of the neighborhood, you know, one, hear the process um, that we're going through because it's a pretty defined process. I've gone through before with intersection safety improvement audits um, and get to get this hear the results of, of where the data is. So again, if residents are interested in coming, you know, the information will be available on the website. If there's any detailed questions, they can always email me through our email portal on the website, uh, dpwattown.northboro.ma.us. Um, beforehand, everybody will be in the, in the room at the high school. CMRPC will do a half an hour, 45 minute discussion about what they have for information, what's been gathered to date, what their findings are, and then describe the goals and objectives of the walking audit. You know, there's a prompt list with a bunch of topics just to get people's, you know, minds moving in the in the same in the right in, in the same direction. We'll walk, brainstorm a little bit on the walk, go back, and when you go back, that's when kind of the rubber hits the road, and and you get comments and ideas from a variety of perspectives um, that maybe me as the DPW director, some engineer, don't see and hear because I don't live where Kristen and Leslie live, and. You know, Chief Liva may see something that that you know uh, Julianne would not. So, it's a very useful exercise. I've seen it uh, produce some some really good results. Um, I just um, that, that's that's the goal and objective. It's a it's a productive three hours of brainstorming. Okay, thank you very much. Um, from that perspective, I would just make the observation that if if it's participatory, we would not want more than two board members participating. Uh, certainly because then we'd have a quorum and that's a different matter to address. So um, it seems to me at most two board members um, would, uh, would participate in this. Um, yes, Kristen? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, piggybacking on what Scott just said, it, it isn't like we're voting on anything or um, there's, there's not really a place for people to have um, I, I was reading the in the in the packet. There's not really a place for people to have a um, any kind of emotional outburst or anything. It seems like a very organized meeting that they the CMRPC must do this all the time because it's very well um, explained and designed how they do this, what they're going to talk about, what time everything's going to happen, and um, I don't know. So as far as your Usually I, I would uh, very much appreciate two different points of view, but I feel like that's that's not really um, what this meeting is about. I think if you live in the area, um, you might be able to have something to contribute or not. In my case, I would be happy to just go and listen to what these people have to say. Um, I found their last presentation that they did for the planning board <laughs> kind of actually riveting, unlike the auditing papers. So um, it was, yeah, so I, so yeah, I feel like, um, you know, the more people who, who kind of, even if, even if you don't live on Bartlett, but if you drive through here a lot and you've experienced um, kind of what the traffic can be like um, or what the, if you've had an accident on this street, if you have a kid at the high school, those are those are all people who might have something to say. Thank anyway. you, Kristen. 
I'll stop. Uh, any other comments, questions? Julianne? Scott, what, who's representing the school? Is anyone from the school committee? In, um, are you asking for one person from the uh, ARHS school committee? Or I, I forgot the, the list. It's um, uh, the, the high school will be represented. It won't be from the school committee. It'll be from the operation side who has a better sense of what the traffic is like in, in and out, what the operational um, conditions are at the driveway and when, um, you know, school committee members obviously welcome to come. Um, we're, not, we're not closing the door on anybody, but, you know, like Kristen said, you know, it, it, having a, use, a, a, a useful group of folks that, that, you know, one, bring knowledge that others may not have, i.e. the school operations or, you know, somebody on Hemlock or, you know, uh, Stuart Brook um, or Bartlett, that, that's, that's important. I don't, I don't live there. Um, you know, the, the representative from the high school doesn't live there, neither does, you know, Chief Liver, but we bring perspectives that may be a little bit different. So it's, it's trying to get, you know, like the ultimate melting pot so that everybody can get together and, and, and come up with some ideas that may not be obvious to, you know, just me or just you, you know? Okay. Uh, is, is there a decision we require to make tonight? Nope. I just wanted to take a few minutes to announce it and let everybody know that it's on the, it'll be on the website tomorrow morning. And if any residents reach out to, to the, um, to board members and are looking for the information, you can send them to me or you have the information in your packet. So it's, it's, um, you know, we, we want to encourage participation. Very good. Uh, any other uh, questions, comments, concerns, board members? Julianne? Sorry. Um, okay, so the intersection turning movement counts. That was ju just one day of counting that? Correct. The, the um, traffic counts that we conducted, in, that CMRPC conducted in May, um, showed us when the highest concentration of tractor trailer traffic was present. Um, according to the counters, we, Consumer RPC had that information. We conveyed it to them to say, we want, you know, there's limited resources. We can't, you know, afford, they, they can't afford to have folks out there 24 hours a day counting. So let's, let's get the physical persons at these intersections when the data showed the highest concentration of tractor trailers. And those were the time slots in the, in the day that we, that CMRPC selected for the counts. So yes, those were um, specific time periods on one day for Bartlett and 20 and Lyman and Bartlett. Amazon was a little bit different. Um, we you know, went a little further and had the video camera set up so that it was a 24 hour capture at the driveway. So um, this was brought up to me. We, we will be entering the holiday season is there any way of projecting, can Amazon project how many more vehicles than 1,700 per day are going to be in and out of there? I don't know an answer to that. I don't have an answer to that. I don't know. Okay. All right, that's it for me. Very good. If there's nothing more. All right. Thank you very much, Scott. Appreciate uh, your being you here this board. evening. Thank you, board members. Uh, next up is a past the hour of 7.35 p.m. We have a public hearing, once again, to uh, address the implementation of Jake Break Prohibition on Bartlett Street, pursuant to Town Code Chapter 2-44-130, Compression Break Use Restriction. John, would you like to present this? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Um, so as you know, um, the Board of Selectmen actually proposed a new bylaw under Article 39 of the May 2021 uh, Annual Town Meeting. Uh, provided a copy of that in your report, or in your packet rather. Uh, I'm just gonna read very, it's one paragraph. I'm just going to read it. Uh, so it's uh, compression brake use restricted. No operator of a diesel truck shall use an engine brake, compression brake, dynamic brake, or mechanical exhaust device, also known as exhaust or jake braking, 
designed to assist in the deceleration or braking, except for emergency use while operating a vehicle on a public way or designated portion of a public way in the town where such use is prohibited by a traffic rule or regulation issued by the Board of Selectmen after a public hearing. Whoever violates the bylaw shall be punished by a fine of $100 for the first offense and $300 for a second and subsequent offenses. The owner of the vehicle may be cited in lieu of the operator. So essentially what this is, uh, is a, a prohibition against Jake breaking, which, uh, um, which is interesting. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is that these vehicles actually by law required to have these compression brakes. Um, so you can't outlaw them and you can't just say, we want a prohibition across the entire town. Uh, that's not allowed. And you can't place one, a prohibition on a state road, like say uh, Route 20. Um, so uh, what the bylaw uh, allows the board to do is look at specific roadways uh, and to determine whether or not uh, a Jake break prohibition is appropriate at that location. So this bylaw was proposed specifically uh, at the request of residents out on Bartlett Street. Um, whether or not it applies to other areas of town remains to be seen. But in accordance with that bylaw, the process is uh, that you get a request and then you hold a public hearing and then the board can make the decision. And so we took it upon ourselves since the board uh, proposed this uh, based on the request. Uh, this is the first meeting that you've had following the attorney general's approval of the Jake breaking bylaw. So this is the first opportunity uh, you have to take this matter up. Um, as uh, we've discussed at previous meetings, zoning bylaws, changes to general bylaws, those need to be approved by the attorney general. And typically they take uh, 90 days from the, from the conclusion of town meeting. They have 90 days uh, uh, to uh, render their decision. Um, on occasion, oftentimes it takes a little bit more than that. Uh, sometimes they'll ask for an extension. Sometimes they'll just take a little bit more time, uh, depending on what's going on and how complicated the issue is. So uh, on September uh, 7th, we did get um, back the um, reply from the Attorney General's office. Their caveat or their warning was, hey, just so you're aware, we've approved similar bylaws in other communities, but you can't outlaw uh, Jake breaks because they're actually required to be in these vehicles for safety uh, measures. So tonight, uh, in accordance with the bylaw, I assume the board's going to approve this, um, but it is technically a public hearing. You can take, uh, you, you can take public comment if there is any, uh, and um, uh, all it would take is a simple motion by the board to, uh, to adopt a Jake break um, prohibition on Bartlett Street. Uh, Staff has reviewed it. Our recommendation is to have it apply to the entire length uh, in Northborough of Bartlett Street. Uh, the DBW director was kind enough to provide uh, a graphic of the signage and a uh, locus map showing the locations on either end and, and in the middle of where that signage would be placed. So uh, we can answer any questions that the board may have regarding the new bylaw, the process, um, and then it'll be up to the chairman to uh, to take any public comment if there if there is any. Very good, thank you, John. Um, could you just uh, um, this is this is speaking to a prohibition of Jake breaking on Bartlett Street, and there will be some signage. Can you just uh, um, review where the signage would be that would? Uh, yeah, so that. there's a graphic that's in your packet, uh, basically just past Hayes Memorial would be one, uh, then there'd be one in, in the middle uh, of, uh, of Bartlett Street, and then on the following uh, end of it. The idea is to get it coming from either side and a reminder in the center, essentially, uh, of no, uh, no engine braking. And again, these aren't, you know, th these are... Um, these are bylaws that have been approved by other communities that we're not the first uh, to, to do this. Um, uh, we also want to be cognizant too of, uh, you know, uh, that's, this is a vote of the Board of Selectmen and these signs would make uh, the bylaw enforceable uh, by the police department. So we want to be cognizant too of where, you know, we're putting a lot of signs down Bartlett Street right. and uh, we want to be judicial and, uh, 
and make sure that there's an adequate amount for enforcement. And we believe that's what this proposal does. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions by the board? Uh, Leslie? Yeah, okay. Um, the signage, um, is it going to say, it's on the graphic, it says no engine brake. Um, I know in the motion it says compression brake use restricted. What is the most common phraseology used for something like this that, that truckers see in other towns? And are we being consistent with how we're phrasing this? Yeah, we defer uh, it to the chef yeah. on that. Yes, thank you, director. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through the chair, uh, the vast majority of this signage indicates uh, no engine braking. Um, occasionally, you'll see uh, no Jake brake, but Jake is usually in parentheses. Um, but no engine braking is is the common terminology. the The middle sign location um, is on the town side of Lyman Street. The intent is any tractor trails coming up Lyman Street from Route Nine that take a left um, would after they take that left where the trail crossing is just before the trail crossing. So now the driver is um, driving tangent. Um, he would see the no engine brake sign there. So uh, sign at each portal, Route 20 over by uh, Cedar Hill. And then one right when the truck would take a left out of Lyman Street so that he would see the, he or she would see the uh, no engine brake sign. Okay. And this is clear enough too, as far as let's say there's a driver in a car who's not familiar with trucks. Is this something that they won't freak out and say, oh my God, what is what is no engine brake mean? Is there something I'm not supposed to be doing? So I just wanna make sure that the signage is consistent with where we see it in other communities and that it means something to the people who, who need to see it. It's, it's very common. Okay, thank you. Uh, if uh, if uh, through the chair, if I may, if approved by the board tonight, uh, it would be our intention to also reach out to all the facilities in the area and just as a courtesy, let them know and communicate to them, uh, give them a copy of the bylaw and ask them to uh, to brief their drivers on the the change, uh, so that uh, so that they can make sure that their their folks are are complying. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, John. Uh, Kristen. I just wanted to ask Chief Lever a question. Um, so how do you go about enforcing this? I've seen this in other towns like Sudbury and I always wonder like how do the police enforce this? Uh, no different than like a speeding enforcement. A cruiser would be sitting on the side of the road and usually when people are driving down the street they see a police car, they step on the brake. Well, if the truck does it and their Jake brake is engaged, it's gonna go and that would be enforceable or uh, you just watch traffic. And as a truck comes up to a stop sign to Route 20 um, and, and they do it, it's enforceable. So it's just observation. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, any other comments or questions by members of the board? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Uh, it is a public hearing, Mr. Chairman. Um, sorry, thank you, John, for reminding me. Yep is a public hearing. Members of the public, if you wish to be heard, please raise your hand in the Zoom webinar. I have uh, Janine Callahan. Janine, I'll bring you in. Please state your name and address, and then uh, you'll have an opportunity to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Janine. Hello, 6 Darrow Brook Lane. Um, I, I might have misunderstood or the location of the signs. I think you said one at Route 20, one in the middle of Bartlett, and then one um, up towards Cedar Hill or Hayes Memorial. Is that correct? Yes. So are they facing both directions? There's like, is it going to catch somebody coming off of 20 towards Amazon Hill, as we like to call it? Um, and then them coming in the other direction because they do hit their Jake brakes as they're coming. And if they wanna make a left onto Lyman, you hear them um, because they're trying to slow down because that is a pretty big hill that's coming down towards Route 20. So I'm, I'm just curious as to whether they those signs are going to be facing both directions. And then my second question is, is there any way to get a Jake brake sign on Lyman itself as they're coming to Bartlett Street because 
that is notorious for truckers using jade brakes at that location. Yes, Scott Charpentier, Public Works Director. The, the, the intent is to have uh, signs identifying uh, to truck drivers entering Barlow Street from Route 20. Um, so there'll be a single-sided sign facing oncoming traffic. Uh, truck drivers who leave Cedar Hill or Hayes Memorial and get onto Bartlett Street. Uh, so that'll be facing the traffic and then one facing each direction um, at Lima Street. One over by the, I don't know the trail, the name of the trail crossing, maybe Stirbrook Trail. Um, as a truck leaves Lyman Street, takes a left, he'll see a no engine braking sign there. And as a truck is coming down the hill on Bartlett Street to take a left onto Lyman Street, they'll see that there as well. But they're only single facing, they face the direction of travel. So there's no way, there's none on Lyman as they're coming to Bartlett Street to ask them not to use Jake brakes. No. Is there, a, I know maybe it's a big ask, I don't know, but is there a possibility to have a, a sign added at that location too? Because again, they're, they're booking down Lyman Street and hitting, you know, and that's a, that, I mean, we've seen accidents there, right? That stop sign comes up on you really quickly and these truckers are using their Jake brakes to slow down and it's loud and it's, it's obtrusive. And I'm hoping that a sign can be added on Lyman face it so that those trucks coming to Bartlett Street know that they cannot use their Jake brakes in that location. Well, to the chair, if I may, that, that would be out of the scope of uh, what's on your agenda for this evening, but within the scope of the bylaw for a future meeting, if that's something the board wanted to take up. Yes, I think uh, to be happy to entertain that, but uh, this public hearing did not encompass that eventuality. It speaks strictly to Bartlett Street. Um, we can revisit this uh, with a different request um, for a Lyman Street approach, uh, uh, some signage there as a separate item. I, I, that, I mean, as a, as a neighbor, I mean, I think we would all appreciate that because that whole intersection right there, it's all kind of all encompassing. So I'm hoping that that can be added to an, to an agenda at a later date. Um, is, this, is this public comment just for Jake Breaks? Are you going to have this another? Is, yes. This is just for the petition that's before the board. Yes. Okay. So there will be more public comment later. Yes, there will. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Janine. Uh, any other member of the public wish to offer comment on this petition? Seeing none, do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I move to close the public hearing. Second. Moved by Scott Rogers and seconded by Leslie Rattan. This is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rattan. Aye. And I, Jason Pro, vote aye. The uh, public hearing is closed. Do I have a motion on the petition? I move the board vote to adopt a compression break restriction for Bartlett Street pursuant to town code section 2-44-130 compression break use restricted and that appropriate signage shall, shall be installed at the discretion of the DPW director. Second. Moved by Kristen Wickstead, seconded by Scott Rogers. Any further discussion? Seeing none, this is a, I'm sorry, Scott Rogers. Yeah, I guess, Jason, um, maybe a little bit discussion then as we look to extending it to other locations. So as, as Janine mentioned, you know, potentially into Lyman or other places in town, is there a, a set of criteria that's used to determine appropriate for uh, a particular street or location? Uh, Maybe Sharon that's a question Scott? for Scott yeah. in terms of, yeah. you know, common practical, you know, assessments or. There's, um, you know, take, take breaks outside of emergencies are used uh, often as approaching intersections when there's slope concerns as indicated by the resident. Um, I have received 
uh, one or two emails in the past five or six years regarding Solomon Pond Road, where that hard right-hand curve is going transitioning to Hudson Street. Um, that's the only specific location in town that I've been communicated uh, to by residents regarding um, compression brake use. Um, but, you know, like, like, um, like you indicated, it, 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 it could be just through um, citizen reports or, or slopes and grades. So is there a, oh gosh, a certain threshold or anything that you'd advise us to use uh, in terms of determining whether it's appropriate or not? It's to, if I may through the chair, um, it, it's discretionary for, through through okay. the board. This is going to be the board's discretion. So you hear the request, you'll kind of hear if you know I live on a cul-de-sac and I'd like a no J break sign. Probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, it's not one of those things, uh, Scott. That that is a hard and fast rule. It's a it's going to be a judgment call. Um, obviously, we put this in place um, at the request of residents out on Bartlett. Uh, the board uh, asked us to look into this, so. Um, so if there's a, you know, a number of requests in another area, then, you know, the board can hold a public hearing and, and look at that, uh, look at that area. Uh, but uh, again, you know, you just, uh, you, we, you, you can't do a blanket, it's the whole town. And so there needs to be, you know, a, a discussion about whether or not it's uh, warranted and appropriate. And that's really just going to be a, it's going to be a discretionary decision by the board. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, any other questions or comments? Julianne? Yeah, I want to go back to something Leslie suggested. And, uh, and I, thinking about her comment about how some of us really might not know what no engine brake means before tonight. Um, what, are, what are the sign options so that well, but I think the, I the issue with break, that is <laughs> what, what is the terminology that the truck drivers are going to understand? That is the most important thing. And what the truck drivers will understand is no engine braking. They know precisely what that means. Right. Right. But, but someone like myself would not know that. And I wouldn't know uh, before tonight, I wouldn't know what that, that sign meant. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Kristen, <laughs> can I, Jason, let me just reply to Julianne. So Julianne, it doesn't matter if you don't understand it because you don't have a truck, right? So even if you don't understand the sign, I think it's okay that you're driving past the sign. You're not sure what it means. It really just is something that someone who needs to follow that rule needs to know what it means. That's how I, that's how I see it. Yes. Leslie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes. As long as the people who need to know, know what it means. However, if you don't know what it means, you don't, you, you, you don't want to drive by and wonder whether you're supposed to know what it means and you don't, right. <laughs> you know, engine brake. I mean, I have an engine in my car. And is there something that I'm missing with this vehicle that I'm supposed to not do here? You know, that's, that's why I asked about that because. Well, know, I have, I, I have will, one more. I, do you mind, Jason? Can I, I say one more thing? Just like to organize the meeting, please, yeah. Kristen. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So, did you want to say something? Yes. No. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Thanks. So, um, my son just took driver's ed, though, and I think we're all so fast, so far past driver's ed. We're not thinking of this kind of a, um, you know, we. we we think, oh, is that something we should know? But when you take driver's ed, they teach you all the things you need to know and they may go over this kind of sign and tell the kids what it means and tell them you don't need to worry about it unless you're a truck driver. But we're far enough away from that that we we just know there are things we're you know, going by feel and that kind of thing. I think the newer drivers who are really earnest about do I need to worry about that sign, they, they know things we don't remember. That's my guess. The easiest thing for anyone to do is go to Google and look up no engine braking, and they'll probably get the answer that they need to understand what to do when they see that sign. Well, not while they're driving, though. Don't do it while you're driving. Agreed. <laughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. 
Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rattan. Aye. And I, Jason Pro, vote aye, carries unanimously. Next up is reports. We'll begin with Kristen Wickstead. Meet. Let me find my report. I had the, the map up. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Sorry I missed the last meeting. Um, so I have a few things um, on my committees. Um, regarding the departure of the senior center director, um, a lot of the people in the senior center on the Council on Aging and just regular senior center folks. Um, and uh, we've lost a few other employees over the last year or two. There's this quote about companies. People don't leave bad jobs, they leave bad managers. Now we're not a company, we're a town. So the manager in this case would be all of us, the whole board of selectmen, as well as the senior uh, staff at town hall. So it's really all of us. Is there anything we can do as a group to keep the excellent people that we have on staff to stay? Um, realizing we um, as a town may be competing for staff with other nearby towns. I know that's a factor and that and money is always a factor. But other factors are relevant as well. I think we would be well served to do a little bit of work and investigation on this in particular, since we'll be hiring a new senior center director and we would like them to stay for a while. Um, so I would like it if residents would write in with ideas if they know about this kind of thing. It's not something I have a ton of experience with. Um, the Community Affairs Committee the second and annual jack-o'-lantern contest will be held this fall. It's open now through October 29th. If you want to enter, there is a sign up genius link on the CAC website. If you just Google Community Affairs Committee Northboro Mass, it, their website pops right up. It's really easy, I tested it. Um, you sign up for a drop-off time and then all the voting is online um, later in the month. Um, so this is connected. The second annual jack-o'-lantern stroll is happening on the town common October 30th, which is a Saturday. It'll be 11.30 to 12.30, 11.30 a.m., 12.30 p.m. Um, there will be over 100 jack-o'-lanterns, live entertainment and treats. And that's when, so all the voting for the jack-o'-lanterns is online. You just look at the jack-o'-lanterns that day or later that day go on your phone, you can vote. And I hope I'm getting this right, Susie, if you're watching this <laughs> later. Um, and cause she had a PTO meeting tonight so she wasn't able to call in and tell us these things herself. But anyway, there, there'll be entertainment and treats with the jack-o'-lanterns. Um, as far as the regional school committee, I can tell you that the Algonquin mascot discussion continues the last update I got said that they had decided that Thunderhawks wouldn't be appropriate. So that's out. Um, the next regional school committee meeting is Wednesday this week. So I'll be attending that and they're going to give an update on the mascot. That seems to be the thing people ask me about the most at the schools. Um, speaking of the schools, the school district sent out a survey to families um, what would their priorities be in spending their share of the ARPA money? So I thought, would it be a good idea for Northboro, for Town Hall to send out some kind of um, no. survey? I can hear John saying, no. John, you're not muted. <laughs> I know I'm not muted. I know I'm not muted. We addressed this at the last meeting, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, well, I know you talked about the ARPA money, but the idea of people who don't have kids in the schools having a say on how we should spend $4 million seems like a good idea. However, I realize there's a time constraint and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, there are a lot of complicated things that go on to spending this money, but I still think people should be allowed to tell us what they think um, the how, how the town could use the money throwing out ideas. So if you want, to write to me 
Um, my email is kwickstead at town.northboro.ma.us, or you can just go to the select board um, webpage and there's a link you can click to email all of us. Um, we can share the ideas with town staff. And I look forward to seeing all the many creative ways we could spend this money. And my last thing is my quote, which feeds very nicely into the money thing. The quote is, money is like manure. It's not worth a thing unless it's spread around encouraging young things to grow. That's by Thornton Wilder from The Matchmaker. He's also the playwright from our, our town, which was on our town common not long ago. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, John, would you care to? Yeah, I just want to, just in terms of the, um, the ARPA funding, there's an article in the paper today, which I will send to the uh, board regarding ARPA funding and all of the issues that are going on with how that money can be used. We had also presented at a previous meeting the idea that it's very limited how these funds can be used. The best approach is to use them as revenue replacement. If you are able to show through the formula, which is still being flushed out by the treasury department, if you can show that you've lost these revenues, then it comes through and that will flow through the budget process. And I don't think we need a separate process um, to determine how we're gonna use revenue replacement money. We have boards, committees, a budget process that exists and there are opportunities for input and there will be opportunities for input. Um, as I said at the last meeting, I'm just, I don't wanna create this expectation that we're gonna be building swimming pools and things like that. We don't even know the context yet. And so, as I said last time, we wanna make sure that we're framing this up and that we, we are managing expectations and that the decisions that are do need to be made, and there is definitely obviously a role for uh, public input, that they're made within the context of what's legally viable and what is uh, priorities and necessary um, in terms of the uh, the town. So, but we'll, more information will be coming on that. So, thank you. Thank you, John. Julianne, can I, can I just respond to that quick? I just wanted um, to say that I just asked for emails. I wasn't talking about swimming pools or anything. Julianne Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and actually, uh, um, part of my report is on the same topic. Um, people have been asking me and mentioning that other towns and cities are doing you, you know, some listening sessions and things like that. And curiously, I did attend the cultural council meeting and it was suggested that to them by their state organization that they start applying for ARPA funds. So clearly I think we need to have at least a monthly update on this four and a half million dollars that is available to us so that we you know, set some reasonable priorities. And to that end, I would also like when, uh, you know, when we discuss it the next time to um, even consider hiring consultants. Our staff is very busy and many towns are hiring consultants who spend all their time uh, you know, learning the details and probably the pages and pages of um, restrictions and whatever else comes with this money. So that would be my ask for um, on that topic. Um, back to Cultural Council, they have received all of their grant applications. And I just wanna um, mention that they are looking for members and this is a group that, that would welcome anybody. You don't have to be creative or artistic. You just have to wanna to promote the arts. So. If, if that's something you might be interested in, please consider the Cultural Council. Um, and the Master Plan Implementation Committee met and our first, our first duties are to update the mission statement and set some priorities. So to that end, we are gathering information so that we have the most current information on, um, on the master plan on the master plan itself. And one of the things that we will need is information about four West Main Street. Uh, so I don't know if the answer can be given tonight, but 
there was there's supposed to be a feasibility study on town hall as well as but in 2022 we have the option of taking ownership again do we know what month and how how is that process going to work out we can either discuss it at the next meeting or if the town administrator would like to answer now that yeah uh, you and i had a conversation about this on friday it's may may of 2022 uh so there have been numerous reports uh to the board about that time schedule I don't think there's any doubt that we're going to take the building back. The question is how we're going to use it. Um, it comes back to the town uh, for $10,000. Um, and uh, and uh, then the town can make the decision whether or not it would like to sell the building or use it for a municipal purpose. So the time frame hasn't changed. And I don't believe anybody would take the building back for $10,000. Uh, so then it comes down to how it would be used and that is the point of the uh, feasibility study uh, that we are uh, that we're in the process of working on so we've got a number of things as i've said uh, ongoing at the moment um, one of uh, one of which i just want to kind of step back for a second here you know our health insurance carrier is getting out of the municipal business so we are currently in the process of bidding out our health insurance those of you that have been on this board or, or banana finance board or committee uh, for the past you know eight years or more, you know that that health insurance is absolutely critical. Um, if we get a 10 or 15% increase in that health insurance, it's going to blow our, our operational budget out of the water. That is an absolute critical priority for us to get that, uh, get that bid done and find out where the market is and where we are on that. Um, but for West Main Street, there's no question that it does, the time frame is we can begin uh, to to re, re, to um, take that building back uh, May of 2022, and and as we've said many times publicly, that would be our intention. It's the question of what do we do with it once we take it back? Is it is it surplus, or we're going to use it for a municipal purpose? Obviously, the primary thing that we're looking at is the potential of moving town hall over into that location. That's one of the primary uh, uh, options. So that's what uh, that's what will be taking place. So before May, when we have to sign off on taking it back or not, um, will will we as a body be able to see the condition of the building inside? No, I, I know you had a caller that, that called in and said you should go in the building. It's, it's like saying I should come to your house and walk around. We don't own the building. Uh, we don't have rights to the building. Um, I have been in it, uh, and I've been in it with um, with uh, some uh, appropriate staff. To uh, uh, this one, we're meeting with the owner to discuss, uh, not the owner, but the long term leasee of the building to discuss the turnover back to the town, the timing, what that would look like. Um, so we have been in. Uh, I have been in the building. Staff has been in the building, but um, again, it's not uh, it's not our building to just go into. So, um, but when you're selling a building, the buyer does get to come in and see. So, yeah, yeah, we're not uh, we're not there. Um, okay, but but when we are there, at some point, I, absolutely, at some point, I, oh, yeah, absolutely, great, great, great. But oh, uh, but but it's it's like I said, it's not. It's like we can't just show up and walk around in your house. It's it's a well, private. Okay. It's a private. Um, it's under private uh, management, and so uh, there's only certain circumstances that. You know, folks would be going in there, but uh, but it is that is something. What we're trying to do is reserve the time that we want to work with the current uh, uh, leasee of the of the structure. We would like to work with them so that the people that get into the building are going to be the architects and the engineers that we're going to need to do an evaluation on the systems and the, and the state of the building. So we have some sort of assessment about if we were going to reuse it, what would that cost uh, what would be needed uh, to be done in that uh, in that building so that's the time that we want to get in okay thank you very much that's it for me mr sure. chairman thank you julianne uh scott rogers uh thank you mr chair yeah it seems like uh it's it was a little extended since we last met so by my count um I think I put 15 meetings under my belt uh, amongst the boards and committees that I am formerly a part of or are monitoring. Uh, one thing that is in common is we are beginning to see some of the long-term capital planning starting to bubble up through the appropriate boards and committees. Um, so maybe harking back to 
earlier comments tonight, there is a process for um, budgeting. And um, I will echo John's message from last meeting. 4.5 is not an open checkbook that we write things out of. It is a very structured and very limited method that we use for revenue replacement. And we need to wait until we know what the rules are for that and then use our established processes for putting forth ideas. Uh, and if something breaks, uh, that's gonna trump any idea that somebody has in terms of health uh, insurance and whatnot. So um, stay tuned, be patient, and we will have methods to get the things done that we need to get done through proper priorities. Thanks for the soapbox. Um, there are, um, yeah, I, I'm not, I will not spend more time then. So a number of things are going through their process across all those. And then just uh, finally for my report, thank you to the town staff that uh, provided details on uh, financial um, planning, how those funds would be used, what, uh, what our parameters are for the use of that, uh, that budgeting money, as well as uh, members of town, uh, public works and engineering that provided some details on some of the road and culvert uh, renovations that are going on along town. So thanks for uh, teaching me uh, how all that stuff comes together and how those projects are done. That ends my report. Thank you, Scott. Leslie. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to address the, uh, the comment that Krista made, again, she's certainly welcome to make these comments, but under her reports, um, we all are. But I just I wanna be very careful, kind of the inference about uh, when town staff depart and we have potentially a management issue or a board issue or something like that. Oftentimes people leave because of personal reasons. It has nothing to do with oh, we didn't say nice things to them, we didn't treat them well, uh, you know, whatever. There are a lot of reasons that people leave. And I know that in one particular case, uh, our board members, we all were all privy to, to a note about it. So we do know the situation of uh, a particular person. And I think that uh, it, it's something we can't divulge. It's confidential information. Um, so we can't share that with the public. I have seen comments about it online and it's certainly not an argument that I want to get into online, but I, I guess I want to be very, very careful. We do have fantastic people working here in town, and there are fantastic people who leave, uh, but it's for a variety of reasons. So I, I do want to be really careful how, how that is um, bandied about in public in terms of, of why people leave. It's, it's not necessarily a management issue. There are all sorts of reasons why people depart. So... Um, also, I was asked uh, in a conversation with a resident, and I, I don't think she'll mind if I mention her name, Rachel Armstrong, uh, mentioned something to me that I think is actually a really wonderful idea, and I have talked to John about it, um, the idea of providing our packets online on the town website um, ahead of our meetings. I think that it would be easier for residents to follow along in our meetings if they had the same work that paperwork that we do um you know it's, it's public record anyway and i think that if we can provide that information that it may also interest some people enough that if they can read some things ahead of time they may want to participate or, or watch our meetings i know you can, it's hard to, to tell who's watching our meetings we have zoom we've got uh youtube and things like that but i think it might be helpful to be able to provide that information to residents ahead of time so, John, I don't know if that's something that you wanted to address now or. Um, sure, and unless unless the, I'm happy to through the chair. Um, so I did speak with uh, uh, appropriate staff. Obviously, some things need to be redacted uh, on your license, particularly with regard to licensure. Um, there's personal emails and phone numbers, things like that, but that's certainly not insurmountable. Uh, and we need to make sure that we aren't including executive session uh, documents and materials. But, um, but yeah, that's something I think the day, uh, the morning of the meeting uh, would be appropriate to, to uh, put that up. We need a little bit of time to kind of sanitize some of the packet and, um, and wait, that's certainly something that we can do. So unless anybody has heartburn about that, um, we're happy to do that. Okay. I think that'd be great. I think that'd be a help um, yeah. for people. And also I do like the idea of more people feeling like they're involved and, 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 
can understand ahead of time what, what we're discussing. So I think that would be that would be super, and that would be my request. Um, I also want to thank uh, Algonquin for running a food drive to help the Northboro Food Pantry. That's always huge. It makes a big dent. Um, I also wanted to mention that the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee held a listening session on September 30th. Um, there were some great thoughts and ideas that came through from the people who called in, and I found the committee to be wonderful as far as listening and taking it all in and making the people who called in feel very comfortable. So I want to thank Tim Kalen, who chair, and all the committee members for taking part in that. I'd love to see another one take place. I think that you can have something like that and maybe get a handful of people who call in, um, but then people hear about it and realize, oh, gee, maybe I would feel comfortable doing that. Maybe I will call in the next time and express my concerns or my ideas. So I want to thank them for doing that. Um, let's see, I want to thank uh, the high school also for running the uh, flu clinic over the weekend with the DPW assistance. Um, so thank you, Scott. I saw Dave Robillard over there um, with the trailer. So um, wonderful. I think that was a fantastic place to have a flu clinic. And lastly, I wanted to mention some other concerns that I saw. Uh, people were talking about the confusion that they see sometimes with the entrance and egress out of the out of Patty Lane in the library that oftentimes people see people going in the wrong way and out the wrong way and seem a little bit confused. I know that that's a kind of a very interesting intersection. I know there was a lot of discussion about that and trying to resolve that and make it clean, but uh, yeah, I think in fairness, it is an odd intersection. I can see people who maybe don't use it regularly being a little bit confused. Someone had mentioned the idea, and I don't, I can't remember if these are there already, but arrows on the roadway itself. I don't know if we have those or not, but I don't know if that would help, but um, it seems kind of easy to make a mistake at that intersection. So I didn't know if there was any kind of clarification uh, that we could make there. Um, yeah. if, I, if I may, through the chair. So those of you that were around, uh, it's an opportunity to remind folks because I, I've heard a couple of people talk about, well, you know, Shrewsbury is making some improvements on Route 20 and, you know, why isn't the town of Northboro doing something similar? We did. Uh, we did old downtown traffic improvement. A lot of things were studied, the, all the cycles of, and the, uh, inter, the, uh, uh, the layouts of the roadways, turning lanes were added. Uh, lights were uh, were put in place and synchronized and all this work was done and, and it was a four and a half million dollar project to improve the and enhance the downtown traffic flow. Patty Lane was one of those things. It was originally the traffic engineers wanted to make it a right turn only out. And, uh, and there was a lot of involvement from the neighbors down there and the library and the businesses down there that they wanted it uh, both ways. And so the, that was the compromise. So we spent a lot of time working and talking about that. And that's where the island came in and there's a signage and lane markings. Uh, so, I mean, that was, um, it was, uh, it's confusing because we didn't do what the traffic engineers wanted us to do. We did what the residents in that area wanted. And so, um, uh, and it was a reasonable compromise, but it, it oh, it's always going to be a little bit of a strange intersection if we want it to be, if you want to be able to take a left and a right out of there. And, and we had all those discussions at great length. Again, uh, many folks, you know, uh, are new and weren't involved or around it or it, during the times of those discussions. But, um, but yeah, it is, um, it's a unique intersection for sure, but it was a uh, compromise to, to have it the way it is. So if you want it to be really clear, remove the island and make it right turn only uh, coming out of there. But, but again, that, that, didn't seem to be what the neighborhood wanted. So we tried to work with them. Unfortunately, that's the best design that we could, that the engineers could come up with. And by and large, it's, it's for, you do have to stop and look for sure. Um, but I can ask, you know, we can take a look at it and see if there's anything else that can be done to improve in terms of uh, roadway uh, markings. But, um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting intersection. I just don't want people to think it just happened by accident. It happened by listening to what people wanted and trying to come up with a compromise uh, for that uh, for that area, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and my last comment is uh, that people say they often see people coming out of Pierce 
and trying to take a left onto church. <laughs> I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> it's always tempting to do it, but I don't think we're allowed to do that. But people are doing that, I guess. I, I don't think it's a majority of people, but people were commenting that they see people doing that. And I don't know what kind of sign. I can't recall what kind of signage there is there. Yeah, there's a island roadway marking signs. Again, people, uh, it's an enforcement issue. So we certainly can have police kind of take a peek at it. But um, okay. but people will do what's convenient for them, not necessarily what is uh, what is always legal. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And that ends my report. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Um, so I'd first like to, um, if I'm not mistaken, this is our first meeting since Applefest. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, Applefest committee and the volunteers who uh, made it a very uh, successful event. Um, uh, certainly a lot of uh, activity in the downtown area and at the high school and uh, we appreciate all the programs that were presented. Um, I'd like to thank uh, public safety and public works personnel for their uh, services and support throughout the event. And finally, uh, congratulations once more to Don Rand as our Grand Marshal and um, to uh, Chief, uh, former Chief Hutchins uh, as an honorary Grand Marshal uh, this past year. Uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate Tugas Family Farm um, for their uh, apple picking recognition. They were voted number two on boston.com in Massachusetts. And they also enjoyed the number 10 position in a nationwide uh, poll conducted by USA Today. So both uh, statewide and national recognition for uh, Tugas Family Farm and uh, uh, just uh, no surprise to us. <laughs> uh, I also want to mention the DNI uh, uh, listening session. Um, committee's uh, doing a lot of work, uh, very busy, um, very active, uh, very engaged. Um, they have the Facebook page up. They're uh, getting a lot of activity there. Um, I believe they're putting up profiles of the committee members so that uh, people can get a better uh, 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 grasp of, uh, you know, who's, who's conducting the work and, uh, and who those people are. So, Certainly appreciate all the efforts that are going on. Becca, I think I saw your profile up there and I had no idea you were uh, involved in roller derby. So, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so I just uh, appreciate the work that they're doing. Uh, they're scheduled to wrap up uh, by the end of the calendar year and come forward with recommendations to this board. So I look forward uh, to seeing that. And then finally, I just wanted to mention uh, um, article that was in the uh, community advocate uh, congratulating some uh, some of our local lawyers uh, for some public uh, for some recognition in their profession. Uh, Northboro resident Mark Donahue, who practices at Fletcher Tilton, was one of the Fletcher Tilton attorneys who were acknowledged by uh, best lawyers. Um, uh, and as they described it. Uh, in the article for over 40 years, best lawyers has been regarded by both the profession and the public as the most credible measure of legal integrity and distinction. Uh, Mark was uh, noted as uh, not only best lawyer, but also a lawyer of the year designation. Um, certainly a very, uh, uh, very significant uh, recognition. We appreciate uh, uh, the work he's done in the past uh, in support of the town, so. With that, uh, that concludes my report. John? Nothing this evening. Very good. We next move to public comment. Uh, if, you're conduct if you're connected through the Zoom session, you can uh, indicate a wish to speak uh, by raising your hand. As we explain uh, any issues uh, uh, presented by the public during public comment, this board will not deliberate or make any decisions, generally speaking, um, if there's a simple informational question that town staff can readily answer. We will strive to do that. We ask that uh, everyone please conduct themselves in a respectful and uh, constructive manner. Uh, when you're invited into the room, you uh, please first uh, identify yourself by name and address, and then you'll have uh, three minutes to uh, present your uh, question or concern. So first up, I have uh, Lisa Maselli. Bringing you in, Lisa. Uh, good evening, Jason and the board. This is Lisa Maselli from 13 Maple Street. 
My comments tonight are about the appearance of the town, the responsiveness to citizen inquiries, RFT, RFP draftings, working with the citizens to create safe streets, misinformation and misguidance of bylaws, lack of follow up or follow through that have become apparent and it's time for a reset. While every other town in Massachusetts is working toward improving their appearance, it seems we are working hard to go in the other direction. For an example, what is happening with the landscaping at our police station and the war memorial on Pierce Street? How can this be explained and rectified? Then we have posters, lawn signs, banners, excessive building signage, feather banners, colored lights, neon lights, and more throughout the town that are illegal, some permitted and many not, and they are increasing with time. What's being done about that? For years, the citizens have been asking for more sidewalks, but have been told an outright no by the administrator several times. The sidewalks we do have are used primarily as parking lots. Again, illegal both town and statewide, but that doesn't stop the landscapers, sewer maintenance, contractors, mail trucks, town trucks, and even visitors from blocking the public way. Where is the enforcement? Here's a suggestion for 2022. No new sidewalks, no new fleet replacements. I have repeatedly asked for years for a crosswalk on Maple Street from the credit union to Six Maple for pedestrian safety and was told it wasn't possible. Not possible to protect families who walk their children to Peasley, parents with baby carriages, toddlers on scooters or bikes, dog walkers, why? Where do we go to have our concerns heard and satisfied? No one seems to know. And these issues are townwide, not just in our little area. What I wanna know is where has the pride and performance, credibility and accountability gone and when will it and public confidence return? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, anyone else? Yes, we have uh, John Wickstead. Bring you in, John. Hi, John Wickstead to Stuart Brook Lane. I want to, uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Charpentier and the town. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion about the safety zone that got set up in um, on Bartlett Street. You know, I know we spent a lot of time talking about Bartlett Street, and I want to thank the town. The safety zone's gone up. Uh, it's running nicely. The signs look great. Um, the flashing lights are, are going great. And I actually, uh, I've seen a few trucks, you know, demonstrably slow down when they hit that sign. So thank you. Sorry, is that it, John? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, next up, I have Janine Callahan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Janine, could you please again state your name and address? Yep, Six Star of Brook Lane. Um, I just have a quick question about the CMRPC meeting on the 28th. Um, and Scott, you had mentioned that residents are invited. I think that's, uh, I, there was, I just uh, am a little confused. So residents are welcome, is that correct? And if so, how do we go about being put on the list or however you want to call, whatever you want to call it? Uh, through the chair. Um, yep. It's not a invite only meeting. It's, it's, uh, it's an open neighborhood meeting. Think okay. of it more, more of as a, uh, uh, a traffic charrette, maybe like similar to what we would have had under the master plan de development process. So the agenda is on the, on the website um, tomorrow morning. You know, the, the, the residents just, you know, arrive at Algonquin High School. We'll, you know, meet at the, at the high school for an hour. And um, as I described, it'll be a working session with, with stakeholders and and certainly the residents of the neighborhood are, are substantial stakeholders. So, you know, they're, they're welcome to attend the meeting and participate. Okay, that answers my question. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. And next I have Laura Zeiten. Thank you, Laura Zeiten, Franklin, 17 Franklin Circle. I just wanted to follow up to what Kristen had said about reaching out to the community and having more feedback. You know, I know that she was talking about the CARES money and the fund money, but it would be helpful as a resident if there was more outreach on feedback 
for what we would like to see in our town rather than having it com- continue to be ignored and you know deflected. So I appreciate that she is willing to reach out and to at least listen to the concerns. And I hope that as a board, you can continue to do that on a more regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Anyone else? Uh, seeing none. Very good. Thank you. Public comment is concluded. Uh, this brings us to new business. Uh, first item is approval and execution of a lease agreement for a cellular tower on property located at 119 Barefoot Road, Assessor's Map 29, Lot 30. Uh, John, would you care to present? I'd be happy to. So, um, as you know, when we acquired the old uh, rod and gun club up at uh, Barefoot Road, where our senior center currently resides, there's also conservation land up there and some recreation land. We also inherited a cell tower. That cell tower uh, was a 20 year lease that lease expired, uh, went to town meeting and received approval uh, in order to enter into a contract uh, longer of a longer duration than three years requires town meeting approval. That approval was granted at town meeting. In June, we put an RFP out uh, to bid that out. Um, we received uh, two, uh, two bids uh, for that cell tower. And uh, what we're looking at is a 20 year uh, contract, which is the industry standard uh, for those cell towers. So we received um, two bids. Um, one, uh, one proposer was interested in removing the existing tower and building a larger tower at that location. And their bid was pretty much predicated on that. Um, in terms of the uh, review process for evaluating the bidders, um, the evaluation uh, committee felt that they did not fully understand the, the zoning. They did not explain how, uh, what the implications of that uh, decision would be. And just in general, uh, seemed to make a proposal that didn't seem to have a full grasp of the, the local planning and approval process that would be necessary to do something like that. Uh, the other bidder uh, that we received is the current uh, company or subsidiary of the company that currently holds the lease. It's uh, CCATT, which is an LLC. Um, they did propose to essentially maintain the tower exactly as it is, uh, increase payments to the town. Um, so there's a, there's a base rental fee that they pay to the town. And then uh, in addition to that, for every co-locator, some percentage of those leases also would come to the town. So. Their proposal begins at uh, $60,000 a year and increases 5% each year, plus 40% of the co-locators that are on the tower. And I believe there are four co-locators currently on the tower. Now, clearly this is the company that has been managing that tower since it was essentially um, uh, put up. Um, we have had no issues with them. Um, again, they're looking to maintain the status quo. Um, you know, It's a 150 foot tower. The other uh, company, uh, Wireless Edge, was talking about a 170-foot tower. Uh, that is not something that would be allowed in that uh, in that uh, uh, area by our zoning bylaws without going through a ZBA process. And again, uh, I don't believe uh, that would put basically everything at um, would be up in the air. Uh, unfortunately, they did not propose a status quo maintaining the 150-foot tower as it, it currently exists. Uh, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a easy to compare the two, uh, but in terms of the evaluation, the uh, CCATT, uh, which is the current, the subsidiary, the current leaseholder, uh, has uh, a solid proposal. Their status quo, they're not looking to take down the tower. They're not really looking to do anything different. Um, they're just looking to maintain what's out there. So we rank that as the most advantageous of the two options. Uh, and again, there's a memo in your packet that kind of goes through the uh, process and, and how we came to that conclusion. So I do have, so, I, oh, I should mention uh, at the conclusion, the original lease that the previous owner of the property had uh, uh, was a 20 year tower arrangement. And at the end of those 20 years, the tower ownership reverts to the landowner. So now that we are the landowner, we now own the tower. That's how we came about uh, putting this out to, uh, to for a lease. 
If you recall back, uh, we did a similar project at the police station where we had an old communication tower removed and we bid out somebody constructing a new tower at that location. Uh, and so they had to propose, you know, what they were going to construct as well as uh, how much they were going to pay the town for uh, the lease. So this year, uh, we own the tower. This RFP put it out uh, for a lease. And uh, according to our conservative estimates, and we don't know exactly what it, we know what the base payment would be because it's $60,000 escalated by 5% each year. Uh, but then you have different co-locators that may come and go and their, their lease amounts may shift. Um, but essentially over the 20 year lease uh, for the recommended bidder, which again is CCATT, um, it's, uh, it's about $4.16 million over the 20 years. So uh, the other piece of good news, uh, those of you that were around and remember when we bought that property, the original bond was a little over a million dollars, 1 million and 55,000 if memory serves me correctly. And uh, that bond is actually, uh, will be paid off in 2022. So um, because we purchased that property with a debt exclusion, the revenues that were coming in from that tower over these years had to be uh, put against uh, that debt exclusion because it's a revenue generating component of that land and we got a debt exclusion to purchase that land. So the good news is um, the debt will be paid off. We own the tower and based on this uh, bid, uh, which we worked very closely with town council on, uh, the award of this for a, the 20 year lease would be about 4.16. Uh, million dollars. So um, it's about uh, 1.65 million more than the existing or the expiring lease for the tower uh, that's up there now. So all around, we believe this is a, a, a very strong recommendation and a positive thing uh, because it does not see us increasing the tower height. It's a residential area. We don't want to uh, Again, I can't speak for the ZBA, but in terms of uh, what our goals are with this uh, bid is not to maximize profits by putting the largest tower we can as an existing tower. Uh, that's sufficient. We just want to maintain uh, the arrangements that we have now and working with um, CCATT, uh, I love all the acronyms. Um, it's basically Crown Castle. It's a subsidiary of Crown Castle. Uh, and this is all they do. And uh, you look at their proposal, uh, they're very competent. Again, we've had a long relationship uh, at that site and we're not anticipating really any changes or difficulty. Uh, the only thing is uh, the town will be seeing more general revenue that would be brought in as a general revenue uh, since it's no longer needed to offset the debt exclusion. So that was a lot of information. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, but the recommendation this evening after the uh, formal public bid process would be to award the contract to uh, CCATT, uh, which is an LLC. Thank you, John. Um, the alphabet I, soup. I, I was going to say, uh, I, I have one question. Um, this yes. is a, uh, we're, we're looking to approve a 20 year lease with potentially up to two five-year renewal or extensions Correct. to that. So that's a total of 30 years. And uh, what is the um, structural condition of the existing tower? Um, yeah. Is, is it going to persist through throughout that, uh, that lease? We period? would think so. Yeah. It, it, they, their useful life is far more than a 20-year lease. Uh, really what happens is when they come in and they build these, it's, it's, a, it's typically a 20-year lease because they're amortizing the cost of that construction over the duration of the lease. And essentially by the end of that, it's all paid for. Uh, and so, um, but it doesn't mean that that's the end of the useful life. The police chief will tell you we had a surplus World War II communication tower from like 1950 uh, erected at the police station, which we then proceeded to use for another 50 years or more uh, before we replaced that one. And that's nowhere near the uh, construction uh, quality that we're seeing in these towers. These are long life structures, certainly uh, it, short of a, a, a tornado or some crazy weather event that uh, uh, would, uh, would uh, destroy the tower uh, in terms of it's just its useful life. It should last 
uh, through this uh, next 20 year agreement. You did mention, and I, uh, and I should just want to follow up on this. So it's a 20 year lease with two five year options, but that's at the town. It has to be mutually agreed to uh, those two five year options. Um, it's uh, that's the maximum that you can engage for. And it's fine. There's no harm in those. Uh, you're not committing to those this evening. We're committing to the 20 year lease, which is basically the industry standard for cell towers. Uh, and then the options, somebody else, I won't be here 20 years from now. Someone else can decide whether or not they want to exercise those those other uh, those options. But it's good to have there because you never know what's going to uh, what's going to be happening at that point in time. So um, in the packet uh, is a uh, is a draft of a uh, lease agreement uh, that was uh, put together by town council. The final lease agreement uh, would be uh, completed. We do have it uh, is being completed by town council with the specific information from their proposal uh, in terms of the uh, financing, uh, the duration of the lease. The lease would start on November 1st, 2021 and go for 20 years. Uh, with two five-year renewal options uh, to be mutually agreed upon uh, at the time, um, and um, and that's uh, that's really about it. We're very very pleased with what we got for a result. Oh, I know what I was going to say. That the so the lease agreement is uh, is uh, was included in the RFP as we always do. Essentially, that's the contract. So those are the four corners. It will be spe specific to this uh, company. Uh, so what they're proposing for pay, the, uh, the duration, which should be part of your motion this evening, uh, duration of the contract, and the specifics of the players is what would be added, but that's the lease agreement, essentially. Uh, so you have the RFP, the bid results, the rankings, and the proposed lease agreement for you this evening, uh, for your, uh, for your uh, hopefully for your approval. We Thank certainly can answer much, any John. questions. Sure. Uh, board members, any questions? Leslie. Yeah, real quick, I was trying to scan through this, uh, this second really long document that we had in our packet uh, <laughs> on this topic um, about co-location. Um, did you say there are currently four co-locators uh, co co on there now? And what yeah. is the maximum that can actually be on there? Actually, the, so it's Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile. And I believe that, that that is maxed out at that point. Oh, it is. And okay. they're all current. They're all current. Um, they're all current co-locators. So uh, so really what Crown Castle's hoping is that we will go with them and basically everything stays okay. as is. Okay. They were at an advantage clearly because there were already existing agreements with the co-locators. So they had, you know, really the best information uh, from a financial standpoint. Uh, but it is a based on what we've seen for other um recent bids, uh, the numbers are very good. We made sure they knew that there were other people interested and that we were anticipating getting multiple uh, bids. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, um, you know, the point of this exercise was not to maximize profits by putting the largest tower we could in some in something that essentially is in a in abutting a residential area. That's that's not the goal. We're looking to maintain the status quo and get the best uh, value that we can for the town uh, out of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments, board members? Julianne. So my question is a little bit along the lines of Jason's question. Um, how, how often are these, would this tower be inspected and who gets the report? It's if there are reports. Yeah. The, t the tower company is responsible for, for maintaining the, uh, maintaining the tower. And so obviously they have equipment, they have folks out there on a regular basis because the equipment needs to be maintained. Um, I'm not sure if there's some like a structural engineer report that is required. Um, I'm not aware of that, but, uh, but they have folks out there on a regular basis maintaining the equipment that's up on the tower. I should also mention that as part of the lease agreement, you know, we do have a right and we do use that tower for our public safety, for police and fire, uh, transmissions and repeaters. So we have, we are one of the uh, co-locators on that tower for some of our equipment as well. And that persists through this agreement. And one more question. Um, have there been any complaints at all about, about the tower, the maintenance, any noise complaints that we should know about? 
No, none. Okay. I've, I've, I've been here 19 years and I've never received a single complaint. I think the only complaint the board would likely get is if you contemplated awarding the contract to somebody who was interested in building a larger tower in that location. <laughs> I imagine you would get some comments for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, any other questions, comments, board members? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move the board vote to approve and execute the lease agreement and memorandum of agreement subject to final review as to form by town council between the town of Northborough and CCATT LLC for the lease of the cell tower at 119 Barefoot Road in Northborough pursuant to the proposal submitted by CCATT LLC on July 28th, 2021 for a term of 20 years commencing November 1st, 2021 and terminating on October 31st, 2041 with two five-year optional extension periods. Second. Moved by Julianne Hirsch, seconded by Scott Rogers. This is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rattan. Aye. And I, Jason Perot, vote aye. Carries unanimously. So uh, we will put those final documents uh, together for your signature and let you know, and you'll come in and uh, execute those once the town council has completed that uh, that final mem memorandum. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yep. Uh, next item, execution of cemetery deeds 1129, 1130, 1131, and 1132. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chair, uh, yes, agenda item number two under new business. I'm so sorry. Yes, you're correct. I, uh, I just checked it off somehow. Um, the next item of business is recommendations for appointments to the Historic District Commission and the Scholarship Committee. And uh, I'll just note that in our packets, we have the minutes uh, of the interview subcommittee uh, uh, interviews for the candidates for those committees and the recommendations that were voted. And uh, I now go to Scott Rogers for a motion. First of four. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move the bo board vote to appoint Tom Reardon as an alternate member on the Historic District Commission for a partial three-year term to expire on April 30th, 2024, as recommended by the interview subcommittee. Second. Moved by Scott Rogers, seconded by Leslie Rutan. Any discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead? Aye. Julianne Hirsch? Aye. Scott Rogers? Aye. Leslie Rutan? Aye. And aye, Jason Perot, vote aye. Carries unanimously. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the board vote to appoint Lorna Helms as an alternate member of the Historic District Commission for partial win one year term to expire on April 30th, 2022, as recommended by the interview subcommittee. Second. Moved by Scott Rogers, seconded by Leslie Rutan. Any discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rutan. Aye. And I, Jason Perot, vote aye. Carries unanimously. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the board vote to appoint Vikram Verma as a scholarship committee or to the scholarship committee for a partial three year term to expire on April 30th, 2024, as recommended by the interview subcommittee. Second. Moved by Scott Rogers, seconded by Leslie Rutan. Any discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead? Aye. Julianne Hirsch? Aye. Scott Rogers? Aye. Leslie Rutan? Aye. And I, Jason Perot, vote aye. Carries unanimously. And finally, I move the board vote to appoint Elizabeth Nolan to the scholarship committee for a partial one-year term to expire on April 30th, 2022, as recommended by the interview subcommittee. Second. Moved by Scott Rogers, seconded by Leslie Rutan. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rattan. Aye. And I, Jason Perot, vote aye. Carries unanimously. 
thank you all. And thank you to the interview subcommittee for the work they do. Next up, execution of cemetery deeds 1129, 1130, 1131, and 1132. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move the board vote to execute cemetery deeds 1129, 1130, 1131, and 1132. Second. Moved by Kristen Wickstead, seconded by Leslie Rutan. This is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. <clears throat> Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rutan. Aye. And I, Jason Perot, vote aye. Carries unanimously. Any other business to come before the board, John? Need for a brief executive session. Okay, uh, Julianne, you had something? I did. Um, I, I don't know how to do this. It's a follow-up on, um, on something someone said in a report, which was Leslie's report via Rachel Armstrong. Did, did I hear that we would be putting up the reports for the public to view the day of the meeting? Yes. Well, can you talk to test, uh, town staff to see if we can do that earlier? Most people work during the day and that doesn't really give them a lot of time. We're gonna be having a lot of financial reports that we all know, you know, there's pages and pages. So I think, you know, I don't think licenses are, are, are what people are looking to get information from. So maybe if we could just do the, the, the reports like the traffic, financial, that sort of thing. And if people want licenses, they can do that by request because you mentioned that that would you know, require some redacting. So my, my ask is that those reports be available when they're available to us. The problem in part is that the information that we receive is more complete and includes some information that needs to be redacted to be presented to the public. And speaking as a member of this board, I guess I would like to have an opportunity to review the packet before I get bombarded with questions by members of the public who have seen it and want to uh, kind of preempt the meeting on Monday. So I but think it's reasonable for the board members. I'm sorry? It's going to be available on Monday. So the, the, the purpose of providing the meeting packet is so that it is accessible to the residents during the meeting. They can follow along. They have the information in front of them. It's not necessarily uh, intended to, I don't know what, uh, fully uh, have an opportunity to, you know, we're, we're trying to provide the information it's going to require some extra work to, to package that for the public compared to what it takes to present it to the board, okay. if I understand it right. It, again, just so everybody understands, I lose all my staff at noon on Fridays, and it's often times where I'm here late hours afterwards uh, because I'm waiting on information. It could be uh, information from council or from, from other entities, and so... You know, this is, I don't want to, I'm, I'm hesitant, at least in the beginning, to be committing to putting this stuff out, um, you know, by the end of Friday, uh, when I don't, my, I may not have staff and packets may be going out late. And uh, the idea is, as of, if it's up first thing Monday morning, then people can, as the chairman said, you can see it and follow along with it in real time. Um, but you know, again, we're trying to trying to reach a compromise here of something that we we can commit to. So I lose my staff at noon on Fridays. I'm still here, but it means I'm doing it all by myself. So um, that's why the compromise, or why I would propose it as a compromise for Monday. Again, we're happy to do it. It's just it takes a another round of of going through stuff. And and again, I like to say everything gets done by noon on Friday, but the reality is that some of this stuff doesn't. You know, we're waiting on things from other folks. Sometimes it takes a, a, a little bit later. We have late breaking stuff that, that sometimes will happen. So, Okay, thank you. It's just my opinion. And finally, 
We have executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21, Subsection 6, Purchase of Real Estate, Fire Station Project at 61 and 65 West Main Street. Due to the Chair's determination that a discussion regarding these matters in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the position of the Board. Do I have a motion using that substantially same language? Yes, Mr. Chair. I move the board vote to enter into executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 38, Section 21, Subsection 6, Purchase of Real Estate for the Fire Station Project at 61 and 65 West Main Street. Due to the chair's determination that a discussion regarding this matter in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the position of the board. Second. Moved by Leslie Rattan, seconded by Scott Rogers. This is a roll call vote. Kristen Wickstead. Aye. Julianne Hirsch. Aye. Scott Rogers. Aye. Leslie Rutan. Aye. And I, Jason Pro, vote aye. Carries unanimously. We will now move to executive session. We will not uh, uh, return to open session. Open session is concluded and no further open session business will be conducted tonight.